We will now begin the International Symposium on Korea Peace on the 70th anniversary of the Korean War Armistice. It's 2 p.m. in Korea. We will now begin. We will now begin. My name is Nam Gi Pyeong. I'm the program executive of the Reconciliation and Reunification Committee of NCCK. I'll be moderating this session. Uh, the threat of war is greater than ever before. We are commemorating the 70th anniversary of the armistice this year, and even this armistice is unstable. We are not sure whether we can maintain this armistice state for now. Uh, so the prospects are not bright at all. Uh, the civil society uh, is very determined that we will that there should never be another war on the Korean Peninsula. So our commitment and dedication is needed more than ever before. In commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the armistice, we have come together to explore uh, the situation we are in right now and to st plan steps for the future. So I hope that we'll be able to gather our wisdom to find again the hope for uh, the future. I'd like to welcome everyone here in person as well as those who are joining us online. We will now begin with an opening ceremony and an opening address. I'd like to invite the first speaker, Mr. Kang Myung-sik, to the uh, podium. He is the co-president of the Korean Sharing Movement as well as the co-representative of the Korea Peace Appeal Campaign. A warm welcome and wishes for peace to all attendees, whether you are in, with us in person or joining us remotely as we gather for this international symposium in recognition of the 70th anniversary of the Korean War Armistice. The event is being hosted by the Korea Peace Appeal Campaign in collaboration with the Forum on Peace and Diplomacy of the National Assembly and the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict. I like my heartfelt thanks go out to both national and international experts as well as the peace activists. And my profound gratitude also to Eng Sai Khan, Jaga Sai Khan, and Jerry Pillay. Today marks the 70th anniversary of the signing of the armistice. Exactly 70 years ago, the 27th of July, 1953, marked the date that the Korean War had lasted for three years. And there was uh, no uh, ceremony or spirit of reconciliation. And a reporter said that there was no sense of ceremony, no spirit of reconciliation at Panmunjom. It was absolutely clear that it, this was a ceasefire, not peace. And he aptly entitled his article, The Strange Pause in the Battle. Now we have to change this armistice into the uh, official end of the war and to a peace treaty to establish permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula. However, uh, despite these aspirations, we are seeing tensions escalate in the, uh, on the Korean Peninsula. And uh, if we continue to demonize the other and our adversaries and flaunt military strength, can we truly foster peace? Do the joint exercises and military buildup escalated by North South Korean and US authorities under the guise of normalization truly stabilize security on the Korean Peninsula? No. The adage, you want, if you want peace, prepare for war, holds little relevance on the Korean Peninsula today. Sustainable peace can only be achieved through sustainable efforts. In 1991, approximately midway through the 70-year armistice, the North and South Korean governments signed the historic uh, North, South and North Agreements on Reconciliation, and it is now high time uh, to carefully cultivate that uh, relationship. And because this is the aspiration of the citizens of the world. And we believe that the when and 
Wu, back then, uh, gave a speech at the UN and said that the Korean Peninsula will be at peace when the uh, instead of making firearms, the metal is used uh, to make plows. And it is not through pressure and adversarial and uh, relationship and confrontation, but through dialogue and cooperation that we can uh, establish lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. And the North Korean government has to acknowledge this as well. And also, we need the peace efforts and activities of the international NGOs and civil society. Once again, I extend my sincere gratitude to everyone who has set aside precious time from their busy schedules to be part to be with us. Thank you very much. Next, I'd like to invite Won Young Yi, President of the National YWC of Korea uh, and co representative of Korea Peace Bill Campaign. Please welcome her with a big round of applause. This is only English, I speak. <laughs> Maybe not. Yeah, but I'm going to speak in Korean. Nice to see you, Mr. Uh, and Zai Khan from Mongol and uh, Tapan Mishra, yeah, India. Because we love peace and we are all peacemakers, so we became, we become friends really quickly. It's nice to see you all here. Now I'm speaking in Korea. 네, 정전 70년 국제 심포지움 휴전에서 평화를 This symposium marking the 70th anniversary of the Korean War Armistice is a very timely event. I'd like to welcome you all uh, to the uh, symposium and I'd like to share my greetings of peace. So in the last uh, three years, the civil society from home and abroad uh, has uh, conducted uh, the Korea Peace Appeal campaign to end the war. For uh, more than uh, 800 national and international organizations and institutions, political parties and politicians, as well as countless people have signed the Korea Peace Appeal and sent us their overwhelming support through spreading peace, starting with the Korean Peninsula. News of ongoing wars and conflicts from around the world seem to never stop. The new Cold War, which began with the war in Ukraine, is fueling the global arms industry and threatening peace in East Asia. War spreads hatred and conflict across the globe. Vulnerable people become even more at risk, creating a double threat of violence and suffering for women and children. The Korean Peninsula has repeatedly re relieved its history of conflict, antagonism, and confrontation with more than 70 years of endless war and national division. There seems to be no end to the war in sight, but instead we are full of actions that fuel it. Nevertheless, through the, through the tragedy of this war, we have experienced the power of solidarity and the strong desire for peace from the international civil society beyond the Korean Peninsula. Above all, we have come to realize that our hope lies in the unified actions of enlightened citizens. Many express their love and longing for peace, but fairly few truly act to achieve it sincerely. Therefore, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all those who have fought and joined this campaign as peace activists.
the power of solidarity and cooperation for peace that we have discovered through the Korea Peace Appeal campaign should now spread as an energy of peace, not only in East Asia, but in the rest of the world. It is my sincere prayer that all of these actions for peace will not be in vain, but lead to the fruits of true reconciliation and justice. Again, I'm very glad to meet you. I hope we can have a productive discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Wan. At the International Symposium on Korea Peace, uh, we have all gathered today to talk about peace establishing peace on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, once again, I'd like to welcome all of you. And we joining us to welcome all of you uh, is Mr. Han Chung Mok, who is the chairperson of the Korea Alliance for Progressive Movements and the co-representative of the Korea Peace Appeal Campaign. Please welcome him with a big hand. It is wonderful to witness the presence of numerous experts and activists from all over the world at our international symposium commemorating the 70th anniversary of the Korean War armistice. I'd like to express our gratitude to Lima Boya as well as Jerry Pillay for their special congratulatory messages that they have sent today, as well as to all the experts and activists who are speaking at the event. We extend our thanks and solidarity to all of them. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the Korean War armistice. Korean civil, Korea, South Korean civil society and religious communities, including the South Korean Committee for Implementation of the June 15 Joint Declaration and the Korea Peace Appeal Campaign, joined forces due to a growing sense of urgency that the war should no longer continue. Earlier this year, we coordinated the Korea Peace Action for the 70th anniversary of the armistice, seeking to gather one million signatures from around the world for peace and organizing 300 peace actions. The efforts of numerous organizations, individuals, and fellow citizens who have responded to the proposal of Korean civil society and actively carried out actions in over 300 places worldwide have deeply moved and empowered us all. We are inspired to take more, even more proactive action and stand in solidarity with the citizens of the world. Now more than ever, we are witnessing the escalation of the threat of war on the Korean Peninsula and in East Asia, a threat that has become more pronounced and structural. The crisis is intensifying to the point where maintaining the precarious ceasefire regime may be challenging. While there have been opportunities to resolve this crisis, the South Korean and U.S. governments have prioritized formalizing the deployment of U.S. nuclear strategic assets, bolstering their military forces, expanding anti-DPRK and anti-China military exercises with the ROK, and strengthening the U.S.-Japan, U.S. ROK, and U.S.-Japan-Korea military cooperation. Unfortunately, they have not effectively implemented the 2018 inter-Korean agreements and the DPRK-U.S. agreements. Following his belligerent statements that he was ready for preemptive strikes and all-out war, President Yoon suk yeol has labeled those who support the declaration of the end of the Korean War and the lifting of sanctions against North Korea as anti-state forces or enemies of the state. He has appointed as the Minister of Unification the commander for, ex for exchange, inter-Korean exchange and cooperation, a man who has advocated for the destruction of the North Korea Korean regime. This is a declaration of full commitment to maintaining a hostile stance and applying military pressure on North Korea. However, achieving peace through force is not possible. After enduring continuous military pressure, we are now faced with the undeniable fact that North Korea has achieved full nuclear capability and a response of head-to-head -head confrontation. The only solution to achieve peace is to abandon hostilities and cultivate better relations. 
Today, unilateralism, which undermines the sovereignty and peace of other countries in the pursuit of one's hegemony, is being challenged in every corner of the world. The trend towards global multilateral co cooperation is already in full swing. The current governments in the United States, Japan, and South Korea are imposing an outdated system of warfare and conflict on us. However, through strong solidarity and resistance, we will usher in a new era of life, security, sovereignty, sovereignty and peace for all. Let us stand together in even stronger solidarity. Once again, I extend my greetings of solidarity to all of you who have joined us at this international symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Han. Today's symposium uh, is being broadcast live uh, online on YouTube. We'll uh, now invite uh, the next uh, speaker, uh, Chair of the Blue Banner and former permanent representative of Mongolia to the UN, uh, His Excellency uh, Jalga Saikan. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This symposium marking the anniversary of the Korean War Amstis is a very timely event in discussing where the peninsula is after seven decades of the Amstis Agreement, where it should go from here, and what strategy needs to be taken to strengthen peace on the Korean Peninsula and uh, in Northeast Asia. That's why it is a very important symposium. Today, the overall situation on the region is very tense and fraught with possible unintended consequences for peace and security that we all know now and feel. Therefore, concrete measures to lower the tension and peace building are needed. Hence, this symposium provides an important platform for civil society organizations, experts, and scholars to share their views on how to practically move from the armistice to stable peace and denuclearization. Blue Banner is part of the GPAC's Northeast Asian Network. Its aim is to promote nuclear non-proliferation and trust in the region by denuclearizing the peninsula and establishing a Northeast Asian nuclear weapon-free zone. This would serve the interests of all, enjoying good relations with both Koreas, a traditional friendship uh, with North Korea, and co a comprehensive partnership with South Korea, Mongolia tries to play a trust and bridge building roles, which are vital for meaningful regional dialogue and cooperation. This I see as our role. To that end, Mongolia is promoting 1.5 track Ulaanbaatar dialogue in the region to focus on soft security issues, which are very, very important as well, and on common infrastructure to development issues, while the Northeast, the GPAC Northeast Asian Asia is uh, promoting a track to a dialogue known as Ulaanbaatar process that is intended to support the 1.5 track processes as well as strengthen the role and the voice of civil society organizations in all this. That would benefit not only the Korean people, but the Northeast Asian region and well beyond it. These processes make Mongolia a hub for third parties, states as well as NGOs, in supporting regional confidence and peace building and turning the armistice agreement into a stable peace. I hope that today's symposium would be helpful in all of this. With that, I wish the participants productive meeting and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. 
Now we have about 50 participants uh, joining us online as well. The last speaker for the uh, opening ceremony uh, has sent a video message. Uh, General Secretary of the World Council of Churches, Reverend Jerry Pillay. Uh, before we play the uh, video, uh, let me make a housekeeping announcement. On YouTube, uh, you can uh, find uh, the uh, live broadcast link uh, by searching uh, Korea Peace Appeal. Please share the link with uh, the people uh, you know. Uh, in uh, under the video, there are links uh, for signing the petition uh, in the booklet for today's symposium. Uh, let us now take a look at the uh, video uh, message. Sisters and brothers, I send you my greetings from Geneva, Switzerland, and my regrets that I cannot be with you in person for this important international conference organized by the Korean Peace Appeal Campaign marking the 70th anniversary of the Korean War Amistice Agreement. I congratulate all of you for your persistent and determined commitment to peace on the Korean Peninsula, in the region and throughout the world. I strongly associate myself and the WCC with that commitment. Indeed, the World Council of Churches recognizes that it is a Christian calling to be peacemakers in all places and at all times persistently advocating for peace and reconciliation against all the forces of the world that drive us towards conflict and division. Sadly, it seems that this calling is tested now in an increasing number of contexts. And as you know, this is so relevant in the Korean Peninsula. The WCC has accompanied the search for peace on the Korean Peninsula and for the peaceful reu reunification of the divided Korean people for almost 40 years, supporting the efforts of Christians from both South and North Korea to promote dialogue, encounter, and cooperation rather than provocation and confrontation. I take this opportunity to pay special tribute to the faithful work for peace carried out over these several decades by and through the National Council of Churches of Korea, as well as through the wider Korean peace movements. At a time when tensions and confrontation in the region are once again on the rise, and when the political context nationally and internationally does not favor peace, your commitment is needed now more than ever. For this challenge, you have strong networks of support and accompaniment internationally, including the World Council of Churches. At the WCC's 11th Assembly in Karlsruhe, Germany, in September 2022, the Assembly adopted a minute on ending the war and building peace on the Korean Peninsula, which urged WCC member churches and partners to renew the solidarity to the actively support and accompany the Korean churches in the advocacy, including through the Korea Peace Appeal Campaign. And just last month, the WCC Central Committee followed up with a statement on the 70th anniversary of the Korean War Armistice Agreement, which observed that 70 years of suspended state of war is illogical and a deeply unconstructive context for engaging with current realities on the Korean Peninsula. Accordingly, the statement renewed our long-standing appeal for steps to be taken to declare a formal end to the Korean War and to replace the 1953 Armistice Agreement with a peace treaty. It called on all WCC member churches and ecumenical partners, especially those in countries whose forces participated in the Korean War in 1950 to 1953, to advocate with the governments for such a declaration and peace treaty. And it urged the governments of the USA, Japan, South Korea, and North Korea to refrain from statements and military action that risk further escalating confrontation and tensions in the region, and instead take steps to reduce tensions and to create an environment conducive to dialogue. It is my prayer that these expressions, which I share with you now, will serve to convey our solidarity and to encourage you and strengthen you in your continued work for peace. I pray that you will never give up hope for peace on the Korean Peninsula 
despite the seemingly insurmountable obstacles on this path, but that we will continue to work together for peace until God willing it is achieved. The WCC continues to struggle with you in the pilgrimage of justice, reconciliation, unity, and peace. Please remain assured of our continued praise and support. Blessings and peace in our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you. 네, 감사합니다. 어, 마지막으로 Thank you very much. 교황께서 we have messages on peace uh, from uh, Dalai Lama and uh, another message from the Pope uh, will be released uh, pretty soon. So please remember that there are religious leaders across the world who care for the fate of the Korean Peninsula on this uh, 70th anniversary. Let us now move on to session one uh, with the theme of uh, where um, are we and where we should go uh, in a few minutes.
자, 여러분 안녕하세요. 반갑습니다. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to meet all of you. Thank you very much for being with us today. And we are now uh, relaying uh, this conference real time online through YouTube. So I'd like to ask every, as many people as possible to join us online. Uh, the International Symposium on Korea Peace on the 70th anniversary of the Korean War Armistice will begin from now. Session one will begin, and I'll be moderating this session. My name is Cho Young Mi. I'm the ex executive director of Korean Women's Movement for Peace and the executive committee member of the Korea Peace Appeal Campaign. Yes, today is the 27th of July, and in the opening remarks, many of you mentioned how sad and frustrating it is that the war has not ended completely, that it is just at a pause. Uh, this puts us at the risk of the war flaring up again. And there is continued arms race, and we are facing so much uncertainty on the Korean Peninsula and in this region, and so much confusion and chaos, and we are seeing a rise of uh, nationalism as well. And in the midst of all this, the movements in national security and uh, in of the countries in this region is causing even more tension and uncertainty and huge concerns. In Northeast Asia, for to establish a virtual cycle for peace and security, we need to look at how we can uh, break out of the arms race and uh, go for coexistence among all humans and even non-human beings. And so we have to walk our talk and put our actions, put, uh, put our thoughts and beliefs into action. And for this symposium, we are here with us uh, here together with all the uh, overseas as well as local organizations, uh, as well as Blue Banner. We had a press conference, held a press conference just this morning to appeal for cooperation and reconciliation in order to establish peace. And that call for uh, peace efforts, I hope that it will echo through a, and become a reality on the Korean Peninsula. In the first session, we will be looking at where we are today and where we should be headed for. We have to end adversarial uh, relationships and conflicts within this, uh, on the Korean Peninsula. On the 70th anniversary of the uh, armistice, and we are relaying this conference on uh, real time online through YouTube. So, and we have many people, more people than is in this hall. So, if you are attending this session online, then please. Uh, type out your replies or comments on YouTube, and we'll collect those uh, opinions and questions and deliver it to the staff. And the same goes for the people who are in the hall. Uh, please pass on your notes. We have five people uh, in the first session. I will give you 15 minutes each. But since I'm a softie, I will give you two more minutes than the 15. So I'll give you maximum 17 minutes. And I'm sure that you will find that time, 15 or 17 minutes, pass very quickly. But we are trying to uh, keep time keep, keep time as strictly as possible so that many more people can speak up. I'm a very poor timekeeper, which makes me a very poor moderator. And so the organizers were very worried about like that weakness. So we have a separate timekeeper for this session. So if you have about three to four minutes left, uh, they, uh, the timekeeper will hold up a quietly hold up a picket, showing that you have a, only a few minutes left. So please try to wrap up when you see that picket. Uh, let me introduce 
the first speaker on the panel for session one, uh, Professor Kim Jun Hyung, the former chancellor of Korea National Diplomatic Academy and the professor, currently the professor of Handong Global University and the president of Korea Diplomacy Plaza which is trying to create a platform for in-depth discussion and debate on establishing peace. This is the diplomatic uh, plaza, and he is heading uh, this uh, Korea Diplomacy Plaza. Please welcome Professor Kim Jun Young with a big round of applause. Hello. I'm Kim Jun Young, as just introduced. I'm very happy to meet all of you. When you were entering this hall, you are, have become entities of enem that are the enemies of the state, and we are here at an anti-state gathering, according to the definition of the current administration in South Korea. We are living in a times when our efforts for peace is labeled as anti-state. If that is the kind of uh, narrow definition of anti-state uh, activities, then I am willing to become an anti-state uh, person or an enemy of the state. And I've made this, uh, had this lecture many times uh, on different occasions, but so I hope that you will bear with me. The Korean government is not talking about the armistice at all, even though we are celebrating the 70th, commemorating the 70th anniversary. And the 1st of July is the 70th anniversary was the 70th anniversary of the Chorus Alliance, that is the US-Korea Alliance. And that is what the South Korean government is focusing on. They don't have any, they don't mention the armistice at all, much less peace, much less a peace treaty. They only focus their efforts and attention on the uh, military alliance. And if you continue to strengthen the military alliance, then we cannot hope for peace at all. We have to talk about the armistice and try to turn it into a peace treaty. But instead, uh, we are talking about uh, the South Korean government and the American government are talking about uh, the military alliance and how to strengthen it. So if we focus on the military alliance and how to strengthen it, then uh, we will move further and further away from peace. So that our efforts here are much more uh, valuable in that sense. And recently, the Minister of Unification was someone who is not fit for that position. And in the Ministry of Unification, there is a implicit taboo word that cannot be put in the uh, in any of their official documents. And any uh, organizations that are supported or funded by the Ministry of Unification uh, cannot use that word. And that word is peace. So don't use it if you want to be funded by the Ministry of Unification in Korea. That shows uh, that they are bent on war, that the South Korean uh, government is bent on war. So we should be guarded against that kind of attitude. Now moving into the lecture proper. We talk about the th past 30, three decades as the era of the Cold War. And we were somewhat peaceful. And uh, we, there were three values that uh, was were universally accepted. One was democracy. In the history of humanity, there were no time where uh, uh, so many countries uh, conducted peaceful democratic elections. And they have uh, reached a certain level of prosperity. And also, it was an era of Pax Americana, or the hegemony of the United States, that kept this world order quite stable. I don't agree to this, but compared to what is happening now, uh, in the past, in the past 30 years during the Cold War, at least we had these accepted universal principles and values. But now the situation is really bad. Um, democracy is uh, retreating. 
And we are seeing many more dictatorships than ever before. And we are seeing uh, deepening inequalities, and we are seeing striking imbalances in many countries, including South Korea, where you have to own property and you have uh, it in order to survive. And God, we are worshiping the money of uh, the God of money. And we are seeing the resurrection of geopolitics in the region. So uh, Pax Americana is also weakening. So I'd like to propose these two certain things uh, that were not created by myself. Uh, these, the, country, the situation right now is post-normal or the new normal or the post-Cold War. If this abnormal situation of just a pause in the war uh, continues, then we should not favor uh, that. It should be co considered abnormal. But now everyone is accepting this as the new norm. So inequalities is accepted as the new norm. Climate crisis is accepted as the new norm. And even this national division on the Korean Peninsula, we are uh, forced to accept this as the new norm. And anti-peace has become the new normal. And this leads to the phenomenon of people giving up hope on a stable and peaceful future because we don't see a solution on the horizon, so we just give up. And this, in turn, leads to a phenomenon where anti-truths or non-truths and even fake information dominates our communities and societies. This was spoken not by me, but in 2016, where Oxford looked back on the few years and came up with that keyword. So camps and ideologies and opinions rather than fact and uh, fake rather than fact and, uh, uh, and instigation rather than persuasion is becoming dominant. And fake news and non-facts and falsehood have more impact on people. So this leads to people and leaders who are not interested in the in uh, public interest or the well-being of their peoples, but their own private interests. And also, we're seeing a situation where policies, even local policies, national policies, become the main focus, and nobody cares about diplomacy. Many people say that this new, uh, this he uh, hegemonic struggle is uh, considered as the new Cold War, but I don't agree. It is, it cannot be compared to the Cold War between the uh, Soviet Union and the United States back in the, during the real Cold War. And the uh, United States, by its very existence and its uh, uh, international policies, is destabilizing the world order instead of policing it. So this cannot be called uh, the new Cold War. And so I talked about the post-truth. But in this previous stage uh, era, we had uh, international institutions that are now crumbling, are being dismantled. So we are seeing fragmentation and also uh, uh, the rise of nationalism. And also geopolitics has been resurrected, in particular, we are seeing this rivalry and competition between the U.S. and China, and they, they, that clash or conflict comes to a head in the Asian region. China has claimed that it will not uh, confront the United States head on in the international arena, but in the Asian region, uh, China wants to be the head. It, on, 
And so there, the conflict is coming to a head with the United States. And so we are seeing uh, these two triangles coming together uh, with the red triangle with Korea, uh, China and uh, Russia and North Korea. And then on the, in the South, you have the South Korea, U United States, and Japan triangle. And so we have not resolved the national division, and we're seeing this kind of triangle. Since the world, Second World War, uh, this situation has never been revolved, resolved. And so the strategy of the United States has remained unchanged since World War II. Back during the war, uh, the European and Western uh, societies and governments actually split Germany to stabilize, try to stabilize the region. And Germany was a war, crimi uh, the war criminal and lost the war. And in the Asian region, you had the San Francisco uh, system that divided the Korean Peninsula into North and South Korea. And this is happening. And the, although the Russia was the aggressor in the war, Ukraine uh, war, they are going to say that the superpowers are going to say that uh, to rationalize this, saying that Ukraine will be the bed of stability, uh, the focus uh, of stability in the European region. And that same could be applied to the Korean Peninsula. But as you can see here, this trilateral alliance is not solid or uh, uh, complete. It is a pseudo trilateral alliance, as shown by the dotted line. Uh, and the United States has always uh, wanted uh, the Japan, Japanese and South Korean government to be chummy, to be friendly with one another. But that wish has not come true. Uh, but they have made constant efforts uh, since the World War II. Uh, as, and you had the 1965 uh, treaty uh, between the between uh, Korea, South Korea, and Japan, and the United States was uh, behind this. And you had the Nakasone uh, administration and Tonduan administration, and you had the you had Ronald Reagan, and so that uh, ultra right wing uh, trilateral uh, alliance was formed in the 1980s during the Cold war. Yes, you said that I had three to four minutes left. But after the, in the post-Cold War era, uh, they failed to institutionalize this trilateral alliance. And so uh, George Bush II emerged to try to reconstruct uh, this trilateral alliance. And fortunately for us, and unfortunately for them, uh, we had a more progressive government in place in uh, Korea. But now what we have is the perfect conditions to strengthen and actually perfect the uh, trilateral alliance, military alliance, because we have right-wing uh, and belligerent governments in both uh, the uh, Japan and Korea. Nakas uh, rooted in the Nakasone uh, administration, we have an administration in Japan uh, that is uh, very active and enthusiastic about uh, uh, improving relations in the way the United States wants with the UN administration. And so Biden. Is has taken up the mantle, and he and the United States was very encouraging of the uh, 2015 uh, uh, treaty regarding comfort women in between Japan and South Korea. And also, currently, the hot issue is forced labor by the Joseon people in 
uh, in Japan back in, during the colonial rule. And so these kind of activities are being conducted very actively by the leaders of these three countries. And at, Phnom, at in Phnom Penh, uh, Korea and the United States and Japan uh, signed a joint declaration to reinforce a military relationship between the three countries. And immediately following that, uh, the Japanese government followed up by revising their security documents to try to remilitarize themselves and also go for uh, to break away from the non from the defense only uh, forces. So they are dividing everyone into those on their side and those who are against. So they are actually fanning this kind of dichotomy here, uh, these leaders. And you have this trilemma that we have to look at if we are to build permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula. You have the uh, alliance, you have the, in the uh, expressed in the yellow, uh, the red dotted lines, where you have the Cor Chorus Alliance and denuclearization, and you have inter-Korean cooperation that goes for denuclearization and peace. So the stronger military uh, alliance becomes, the further away we will uh, go from peace and denuclearization. And as Mr. Kang Yong-shik said during his opening speech, uh, this is something that we I really don't like. It's one of my least favorite adages or sayings. Uh, uh, if you want peace, prepare for war. No, it's like uh, uh, it's the same rhetoric as the dictators in dictatorship in South Korea. Uh, they said, if you want peace and if you want stability, then you have to accept dictatorship. But uh, the Korean people refused that rationale and went on a, democrat, a democratization movement, went on to lead the democratization movement. So in order to move for peace, we have to prepare for peace with peace. We have so far failed to overcome uh, the past colonial era or, uh, or national division. Uh, in the th remaining 30 seconds, I'd like to offer, propose a solution. Uh, the Korean model is very uh, special and unique. In the United States, it was the free and liberal market model where you had the weak state. So the neoliberal market was the king. And in China, you had the authoritarian state model where you had the strong state and weak uh, civil society. But here on, on Korea, we have a strong state and we have national forces. But we also have a strong civil society. You have a strong state, but then whenever that st strong state crosses the line or goes beyond the pale, we will rise up. The civil society will rise up to condemn such actions and such uh, attitudes. So we have the strength and power in the civil society to stop the uh, state from going too far, even if it's very strong. And so we need to create a third zone. We have uh, over 60 allies on the United States, on the side of the United States. And on the other side, you have more than 120 nations who are closely, who have close trade ties with the United States, with China. And you have people who are stuck in the middle, governments that are stuck in the middle. So what we need is a neutral third uh, zone. Uh, countries like Canada and many countries in Southeast Asia and in Asia. They have to come together in a third uh, area or third region uh, to reinforce multilateralism and build up solidarity to face up to and interfere, interrupt uh, the uh, U.S. dominance through multilateral and multi 
multifaceted uh, civil society solidarity, we have to create this third uh, zone. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. So the uh, current Korean administration is only talking about the alliance, but not uh, the armistice uh, regime. And is only talking about peace by uh, force uh, and stigmatizing the civil society uh, as enemy of the state. So to overcome the situation, uh, he stressed uh, the need uh, for international solidarity and cooperation of the civil societies of uh, many different countries, uh, which uh, reminds ourselves of the importance uh, of today's uh, symposium in the uh, civic solidarity behind that. So well, we need to share the stories uh, of uh, the civil societies across the country, uh, especially how uh, people are uh, living and feeling about their lives. Uh, that is why we have invited uh, the next uh, speaker, Professor Kim Sung Kyung, uh, teaching uh, in the um, University of North Korean Studies. Recently, she uh, authored a book uh, on the uh, story of North Korean women. Uh, the book uh, seriously uh, describes the lives and feelings of people on the both sides uh, of the peninsula. Uh, please welcome Professor Kim with a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kim sung -kyung. First of all, it's a great honor uh, for me to be invited uh, in this meaningful occasion. And I'd like to express my deep respect uh, for all people, uh, including peace activists who are working for uh, peace on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, having a conversation with you itself actually uh, energizes and empowers me. Now, um, Professor uh, Kim jun Hyung has just shared uh, the more um, grand uh, perspective uh, about the uh, uh, global system. And um, I'm going to take uh, a, a relatively micro uh, perspective uh, toward what is happening in South Korea. Uh, please refer to uh, the uh, booklet, um, and I'm going to uh, skip skim through uh, the paper. So we are living in this armistice, armistice regime, which is a very peculiar. Some people even say that the Korean Peninsula is uh, essentially in a long peace because there has been no military hostilities for the last seven decades. However, uh, the reality is that the armistice only means secession of hostilities. So it is confined to the military terms. And the military confrontation between the two sides con uh, continues today. So how to turn the armistice into peace uh, is the challenge. And uh, it has been very, very difficult. It is because uh, the Korean War was not just a war between the two Koreas, uh, but an international war. So to put an end to the war, we need a, a consensus, uh, not just between the two Koreas, but a consensus between the US, China, and other in, uh, players. So because of this complexity and interconnections, it is challenging to uh, actually turn the armistice regime into a peace regime. Now, under the armistice regime, both the North Korean and South Korean societies uh, have established the very strange uh, systems. Now, South Korea uh, is rich. However, it is heavily dependent on the United States when it comes to national security. So in that sense, uh, South Korea 
Korea uh, has a fundamental contradiction that it is a not a complete sovereign state. Now the same can be applied to North Korea. The three uh, generation um, succession and the enormous uh, ex uh, military expenditure uh, in North Korea uh, also led to a very peculiar form of state. Um, now, the armistice regime uh, works like uh, the state of emergency, as George Agamben said. Uh, now, Agamben said that the sovereign power continuously uh, tries to create a state of emergency with exception uh, of exception from the rule of law. Uh, so on the current peninsula, just because we are still at war, a state violence in violation of human rights were condoned uh, or neglected. Now, uh, the South Korean society in particular is faced with a huge problem. Of course, we have uh, experienced economic hardships uh, since 1987 and, and at the same time uh, successfully established a democracy. However, uh, the South Korean society is almost unable to have an open conversation we are uh, continuously demonizing the other side, and the North Korea continues to mobilize the people for its own national security, citing the threat from the United States, the need to develop nuclear weapons, and to fight against the international sanctions that uh, was uh, applied, applied to it because of its own nuclear uh, development program, again, continuously creating a state of emergency or exception. Uh, let me talk more uh, about uh, the South Korean society. Uh, I uh, often uh, think about why the uh, gender issue is uh, very controversial uh, in the society, and at the same time, women still experience a lot of gender discrimination. Now, many researchers have pointed out uh, the uh, seriousness of the gender discrimination, sexual violence, and so on. And uh, in a large sense, that was created by the armistice uh, regime, uh, sometimes uh, sponsored by a state. I believe we have to uh, pay attention to that aspect uh, as well. When it comes to the military expenditures, the situation is very serious, as we all know it. According to CIPRI, uh, South Korea uh, has moved up uh, the ladder uh, globally, uh, ranked number ninth. Now, uh, in the uh, Moon uh, administration, uh, the civil society uh, criticized the administration for uh, spending too much on the military, but the Yoon administration now uh, doesn't seem to care about such criticism at all. Now, what complicates the inter-Korean relations even more is under the armistice regime, the two sides are enemies in at the same time belongs to the same Korean nation. Now, this, uh, I believe, uh, leads to a very peculiar uh, mentality. So in South Korea, uh, the more progressive or liberal administration uh, stresses uh, the one Korean nation uh, aspect. We have to you know, strengthen uh, inter-Korean exchanges and cooperation and so on. But when the other side takes the power, the North, North Korea is always demonized as enemy. Uh, in and we need strong military to fight it. So, and uh, these two different uh, ap approaches um, come one after another uh, over the years. Uh, this leads to a very contradictory and divided society and mentality uh, in South Korea. And the mirror image in North Korea 
uh, looks uh, very similar. So now we have North Korea with uh, very much advanced nuclear capabilities uh, in the uh, peace, peace process uh, of the previous administration um, failing. Now, the public opinion uh, in South Korea is uh, getting more and more negative towards uh, unification. Uh, many uh, opinion uh, polls have produced the same results uh, since the mid-2000s, actually. Only about 50% are favoring unification. And in some other uh, public surveys, utilizing psychological uh, method, uh, the situation seems even worse. Now, uh, the uh, older generation or the middle-aged generation um, don't answer uh, survey questions honestly because they were indoctrinated uh, from their education that unification is a good thing. But when you employ a psychological uh, method in survey polls, uh, public surveys, uh, it is assumed that more are actually not favoring unification. So it's not, the, not just a problem of those in their 20s or 30s. Uh, some people talk about the you know millennials and the Gen Z are the problem because they don't want unification. However, uh, the uh, you know, public opinion is almost similar regardless of generations. And you can even say that those in their 20s and 30s are more honest than their older um, uh, fellow citizens. So what is this? Why is this happening? So the peninsula is divided. We are spending a lot of money for the military uh, with the military conscription system. And we are, uh, you know, moving away from uh, discussion on peace and unification. I believe that uh, it's because of the um, serious, seriousness or advancement of the neoliberal um, economism. You know, I still remember the controversy uh, over the inter-Korean uh, ice hockey team, women's ice hockey team, uh, for the uh, winter. Uh, games of Pyeongchang. Now, uh, that uh, controversy really showed uh, what kind of society South Korea really is. Now, the uh, largely negative public opinion on that uh, single team uh, shows that the state uh, should not intervene or violate individual interests or rights, even if it is for a greater cause. And, uh, of course, uh, there is this uh, negative uh, attitude uh, towards supporting North Korea uh, financially. And uh, of course, uh, there has been antagonism uh, to supporting North Korea uh, for many decades, but the nature has changed over time. So during the uh, Kim Dae-jung administration, the opposition to supporting North Korea was more ideologically driven. They were afraid of the financial support being diverted to North Korean military threatening uh, the security of South Korea. But currently, uh, it's more about uh, this antagonism uh, towards using the taxpayer money to North Korea in a way that does not directly benefit us. I believe this really shows the South Korean public's perspective about the vulnerable people in general, including people with disabilities uh, and so on. Uh, so, uh, the uh, current administration is moving really towards um, antagonizing North Korea uh, even more uh, with the uh, recent uh, U.S. Uh, nuclear-powered uh, submarine uh, visiting uh, South Korean port. President Yoon actually visited there in person and said that he is, he feels assured. Uh, what a peculiar a uh, statement a, a president uh, can make. So um, I feel these days, uh, as a society, South Korea faces a lot of problems, and it's getting more and more serious. Many people talk about fairness and justice, but there is no consensus on what they mean. And uh, people are only talking about fairness and um, justice from their own perspectives. They're all different. So I think there are hundreds or even thousands of different versions of fairness and justice 
that are completely disconnected uh, from a public good or a common good. They're not talking about justice or fairness as a society, as a community. Uh, it's only about their daily life, which uh, they feel that they are constantly at war. But I also believe there is a glimpse of hope. Of course, the current administration is uh, heavily driven by ideology, a Cold War ideology. However, that doesn't really resonate with the public who experience the war of survival in their daily lives. Uh, so I don't believe that the current uh, administration's discourse uh, will not last very long. So this uh, Cold War ideology is becoming more and more empty, and I think think maybe in a few years, the public will realize that the Cold War ideology doesn't mean anything in their lives, and we have to come up with a new direction uh, to make peace. So for you know uh, several months, I have been in despair and frustration myself, uh, to be frank, and um, I have dealt with these issues. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, reading uh, novels or watching cinemas that deal with uh, uh, apocalyptic uh, portrayal of uh, the future. Now we are faced with a climate crisis. Uh, uh, the discourse of Anthropocene and uh, even anti-humanism, uh, losing hope uh, for the entire humanity. Now, uh, what are the uh, Korean public, uh, where are the uh, Korean public moving towards? The lowest birth rate in the world and the highest suicide rate. Now, one uh, researcher used this expression that uh, South Korea went through a rapid compressed modernization, and now we are moving towards a rapid and compressed, disappearing. So this really shows the pain that South Koreans are feeling. But at the same time, I think those who are talking about despair uh, and frustration are the ones uh, actually want to be free from it the most. So they have to tell their stories and create the discourse of love and peace, not despair and hatred. Uh, and I believe that is a strong uh, um, sentiment on the grassroots level. And maybe it is only uh, the pessimistic intellectuals who are not fully grasping uh, this uh, grassroots energy. So uh, what I want to say is that we need to start uh, from fully understanding how vulnerable beings we are and uh, we need to also uh, think about the same vulnerable people living in North Korea. Uh, as more money we spend on the South Korean military, uh, the more threat the North Koreans would feel. We need to reinforce this sense of connection between uh, peoples. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kim. I'm sorry for not being able to give you uh, more time. Uh, and uh, I thank you for being uh, very punctual for your presentation. So that was uh, a, a insightful uh, analysis of where we stand in South Korea uh, going through uh, compressed modernization uh, and maybe compressed uh, disappearing as a society. Uh, and uh, she also talked about uh, what we should do for peace in a society where uh, human beings or even non-human animals uh, and non-human beings are neglected. Uh, let's move on uh, to uh, the uh, next speaker. Uh, before doing that, uh, let me say one more thing. After listening to the speech of Pre uh, Professor Kim, uh, I think uh, we need 
uh, to find a new concept of peace by connecting uh, our daily experiences uh, in uh, peace uh, on the international uh, politics level. Uh, as we uh, proceed, we have about 70 to 80 uh, people, uh, 80 audience joining us online on YouTube uh, who can always uh, share their comments or questions uh, online. Now we're moving on to the next speaker. The third speaker is connected online. I'm sure he's a very warm-hearted person seeing his image here on the screen. It's 2 a.m. in Washington where he is right now, uh, a little past 2 a.m. Uh, we have with us Keith Roos, who is the executive director of the National Committee on North Korea and used to be the East Asia advisor to the Senate on uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And I met him a few recently in Cambodia, and I learned a lot from him. And today he will be sharing with us his experience and views regarding the uh, situation in the United States vis-a-vis -vis, uh, North Korea, the prospects, and what is happening right now. Thank you. So please, let's welcome him. Thank you. It's my privilege uh, to participate in the 2023 Korea Peace International Symposium. My comments are my own and not on behalf of the National Committee on North Korea for which I am the executive director. NCNK promotes principled engagement between the United States and the DPRK. Uh, North Korea has been a part of my work portfolio, part-time or full-time, going back to my first trip to the country 21 years ago next month on behalf of Senator Richard Lugar. While the Singapore summit between the United States and the DPRK held promise for future constructive bilateral engagement. The Hanoi summit, as you know, resulted in a breakdown of negotiations. Ever since the Hanoi summit between President Trump and leader Kim Jong-un, engagement between the two countries at the official and non-official levels has largely been non-existent. The root of the present situation in large part goes back to the summit itself. While there was disappointment about the outcome on both sides, leader Kim Jong-un appeared particularly upset as the results seemed to be different from what he had been led to believe would occur. The leader's anger from Hanoi, coupled with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which may have emboldened him, in my opinion, combined to contribute to what may be a significant miscalculation on his part. It appears that the North Korean leader has abandoned any thought, at least for the present time, of negotiating with the United States. The ongoing missile launches and other activities suggest that he is working to advance his national security apparatus including developing the capability of attacking the United States with a nuclear-tipped intercontinental ballistic missile. By achieving such a level of capability, he may believe this will strengthen his position in possible future negotiations with the United States. I believe this is a mistaken approach. I say this because the President of the United States has the responsibility to protect the American people. If the DPRK continues to, to develop its missile and other technologies, and US experts determine that the DPRK is close to being able to launch a missile attack on the United States, there will be those around the president urging him to take preemptive military action against the DPRK, which could lead to a DPRK response attacking American assets in South Korea, Japan, and Guam. 
Aside from the risk associated with the ICBM development, the present escalation of tensions on the peninsula on both sides of the 38th parallel must diminish. Otherwise, the prospect of war by miscalculation or accident continues at a high level. It seems to me that both leaders are confronted with similar challenges in their respective countries. President Biden is criticized by many DPRK experts in the United States for not having presented a detailed roadmap for a possible way forward to negotiate with the DPRK. And yet, if he were to approach the North Koreans with such a proposal, many in the Congress, some for partisan political reasons, would oppose his effort to negotiate. If leader Kim Jong-un were to receive a, deal, a detailed proposal from the U.S. president, there are hardliners around him who might express skepticism about a U.S. offer. Given that the North Korean leader met multiple times with President Trump, but was unable to extract sanctions and other concessions from the Americans. Until a formula is discovered which will interest Kim Jong-un in negotiating, and until President Biden is prepared to submit a detailed proposal for a starting point in talks, we are likely going nowhere. The possibility of a peaceful resolution of issues among the United States the DPRK and the ROK is also frustrated by certain persons in Beijing, Washington, and Seoul who are content with the status quo on the Korean Peninsula and are less enthusiastic about final resolution of unresolved issues. Once that a formula for negotiations and a negotiations protocol is discovered, Perhaps a third party, such as an esteemed individual from Europe or Southeast Asia, someone outside of Northeast Asia countries, could serve as an intermediary, shuttling back and forth between Pyongyang, Washington, Seoul, and Beijing to seek agreement on the terms of a negotiating outline. However, the future of the Korean Peninsula and possible unification are issues which should ultimately be resolved between the two Koreas. Models for unification discussed within the ROK vary, and certainly there are different opinions between the DPRK and the ROK on this issue. Thank you. 네, 고맙습니다. 정말 새벽인데 함께 주셔서 진심으로 감사드립니다. Yes, thank you very much for staying with us at the wee hours in the United States and giving us this excellent speech and insightful uh, presentation. He talked about uh, the situation that uh, the United States as well as North Korea is in and how that could escalate into rising tensions on the Korean Peninsula. And he also suggested, made some suggestions about the way out of this kind of situation. We'll now move on to the next speaker. We have another uh, colleague uh, from the United States. Uh, he's now living in uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. Now, um, there are you know, 300 sites across the globe uh, where uh, the participants of the Korean uh, Peace Occupy campaign are taking actions. And uh, there are uh, women cross uh, the MC, uh, former prisoners of war, uh, and so on, uh, who are forming uh, an, a network called Korea Peace Action. And uh, the next speaker is also part of the campaign. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Dan Leaf, uh, former Deputy Commander of the U.S. Pacific Command uh, and retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant General, who is working on uh, making peace on the Korean Peninsula, who will join us online.
My name is Dan Leaf, and these are my remarks for the International Symposium on Korea Peace, July 2023. My remarks begin in three, two, one. Aloha and ayanashimika. My name is Dan Leaf, and I'm speaking to you from Honolulu, Hawaii, as you can see by the background. I wish I could be in Seoul for your meeting, but I will be in Washington, D.C. at that time participating in events there surrounding the 70th, year, 70th anniversary of the signing of the armistice. I want to thank the organizers of the symposium for giving a chance to me to voice my thoughts on what has become a central passion in my life, ending the Korean War. I'd also like to thank my good friend, Christine Ahn, whom I've, I've only known her for months, it seems like years, but she has been a great mentor and an inspiration for me in seeking this piece. So if you look at your program, you can tell I'm not your typical participant. I am not a celebrity. I'm not a cleric. I'm not a scholar or a typical peace activist. For you to read my biography, you might think me to be uh, an Air Force general, a businessman, a consultant, or an author, and certainly I was all of those things. Uh, but that's not me. That's not how I look at myself, and how I look at myself plays an important role in what I advocate and how I advocate for it with regard to the end of the Korean War. Because you see, I am a fighter pilot. That's how I still think of myself, a warrior. I love a good fight. And this is the most important fight, the one for a treaty to end the war that I can imagine. It may be the last big fight of my life, but I'll keep fighting along with all of you until we get there. Now, my fight for peace is not an apology for my past life in the military, so don't get me wrong. I did what I did. I did it with a lot of forethought and consideration of the moral aspects of it, and I don't have major regrets. Life always has some, but I'm glad I did what I did. Um, and this fight for peace comes from several factors. I'm motivated by many experiences. First is my exposure to Korea and Koreans that began in 1978 when I was assigned to Osan Air Base as a young lieutenant. And I got to know the people, got to know the culture some, got to see over time, because I returned to Korea in 1995 for another two-year stint, this time at Osan, at uh, Yongsan, rather, um, got to see this miraculous emergence of a vibrant, prosperous democracy. And anybody who's witnessed that has to appreciate how magnificent it is. And at the same time, should appreciate the tragedy of North Korea and the life that the average North Korean has. And, and the, the contradiction of still being technically at war. It doesn't make sense after 70 years. I can't stand it. I'll fight to end it. So I have an appreciation for Korea and Koreans on both sides of the DMZ. And that starts my motivation. I also have experience in combat, in the air and on the ground. And, um, you know, as I said, I'm not living a life of regrets. This is not an apology, but I know war. And that makes me especially cognizant of the debt we owe, the 36,651 Americans who lost their lives in combat, the multitude of Korean military and civilians who died, the honor of ending the war that claimed their lives. We owe that to them. I've also thought more than perhaps anybody you will come across about nuclear war. 
in my 33 year Air Force career for a variety of reasons, I had to think about the unthinkable. As a young pilot, I certified uh, to my commander that I would strike a Warsaw Pact target with a tactical nuclear weapon. For a young 23 year old, that's a pretty big step and not something done lightly. Later, I was responsible as a one-star general for overseas storage of tactical nuclear weapons. With the controls for that in our system are very stringent and reinforce the magnitude of what is different about nuclear weapons. Later, as the vice commander at Air Force Space Command, I oversaw the intercontinental ballistic missile uh, fleet for the United States. And then finally, in my last assignment at U.S. Pacific Command as the deputy commander and acting commander, I had unique re decision-making responsibilities. We'll leave it at that. But the bottom line is, as I said, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the unthinkable, about nuclear war. And I know it well. And because I know it well, I know the risk here well. Finally, another part of my life is involvement in post-conflict reconciliation. I had the privilege of working on that both as a military officer and a Department of Defense civilian with Vietnam. And I've seen the complexities and engaged in the complexities post-conflict in places like Nepal, Sri Lanka, East Timor, and elsewhere. Peace is really hard, and I know that, but I know the importance of reconciliation. So all of those things brought me to you today, and this has been a passion for more than a decade that we're marking seven decades without ending the war makes me sad. And actually, as a fighter pilot, it makes me angry. And I won't express it in the pithy way I might to my fellow aviators, but it really makes me mad. We have to do better. And we have to do better now. Why? Why now? Now that I've told you why me, why now? The why now is at this point in time, we are one bad decision away from nuclear war with North Korea. One bad decision. That's all. Over the years, we sought to contain North Korea during the Cold War, the first 40 years after the armistice. From there, it transitioned, the efforts transitioned to halting their nuclear development via negotiation, the agreed upon framework, uh, the six party talks. That didn't work. So strategic patience was tried with the notion that perhaps North Korea would just collapse. That hasn't worked. And then there was confrontation and symmetry and that didn't work. Whatever you might think of all of those efforts, the bottom line is, we have arrived at the most dangerous imaginable place where Kim Jong-un with delivery systems, warheads, and the stated willingness to employ them preemptively could, out of premeditation, misunderstanding, or desperation, start a world-altering war leading to millions of deaths. He can attack South Korea, neighboring countries, and the United States. Might seem irrational that it would happen, but can we bet that it won't? I know the strict controls on U.S. nuclear weapons, and I bet the farm, as we say in the United States, that those controls are not as strict in North Korea. We cannot afford to wish away this threat. We have to do something. And the only way back from this precipice, from this, the edge of this cliff, is to start by ending the Korean War with a formal treaty. Okay. That's not going to be easy, but there's a lot of hard things in the world, and there are a lot of hard truths that we have to face up to regarding North Korea and the requirement for peace. First, as I said, the threat is real. And 
we know he can do it. But if we look at what has happened in North Korea since uh, COVID, we should recognize that it's getting more and more dangerous almost on a daily basis. They are more isolated than ever, less likely to be influenced, and the risk grows of, as I said, any manner of triggers to a nuclear event. In the past, another hard truth is that the most aggressive approaches, confrontation, and the softest appeasement have failed to do what needs to be done. They haven't led to denuclearization or retreat or collapse, and they're not likely to do so in the future. Another hard truth is that denuclearization, while it must remain a long-term goal, I won't elaborate on that, but I strongly believe that, can't be a precondition or first step. If we try to do the very hardest thing first, we're going to get nowhere. Another one, transactional diplomacy will not work. Carrots and sticks do not work with North Korea. They have not worked. And that's why we need to seek peace and a peace treaty on a very narrow, non-transactional basis. Because when we get to negotiation, we can rest assured that the truth is Kim Jong-un and his regime will deceive and they'll fail to uphold any promises. Okay? History tells us that's going to happen. Narrowly limiting our pursuit to peace as a first of many steps is the only way to make progress without stumbling or simply failing to advance. And whatever higher goals we might have, alleviating the suffering of North Korean people, improving human rights, eventual reunification of Korea, or even global peace, will remain out of reach until we start with a peace treaty. Now, my assertions, my arguments will get the usual um, rebuttals based on conventional wisdom that uh, North Korea won't agree. Well, we don't know. We simply don't know. And since nothing else has worked, what is the harm in trying? That they, they, others will argue that there are no incentives for North Korea. Mm, I think there might be. He, the economy is in a shambles more than ever. And while some might call legitimizing the re regime, he did not seem to avoid the, the uh, spotlight during summitry. That giving him a spotlight to advance the ball in peace, absolutely worth it. Um, the United, there's often the argument that the United States uh, must either follow the Republic of Korea or vice versa. They must follow us and somebody has to lead. Well, the two countries have to agree that peace is a goal and then go about it in coordination, but in a way that's compatible with each democracy and each pop, each citizenry. It, we will never sync up two vibrant democracies who seem to have liberal and conservative uh, governments, in op not in opposition, but at the same time, and are and are on different election cycles. We're not. We can't synchronize that. We can't wait for the perfect storm of democracy to get there because it isn't going to happen. Others will argue that this would be appeasement or surrender or legitimization of Kim Jong Un. First of all, the Kim regime has ruled North Korea for even longer than the armistice has been in force. So wishing that that weren't the case will get us nowhere. As I said, a non-transactional, narrowly focused approach to getting a peace treaty signed is not appeasement. It's not surrender. It's the right thing to do. Ending our longest war with a peace treaty is a necessary first step to a better future. Without it, denuclearization is a dream. The plight of the North Korean people will remain a nightmare. And the hopes of our children and grandchildren for a brighter future will be held hostage by the unthinkable. 
as we mark the 70th anniversary of the signing of the armistice, there is no better way to honor the memory of those lives lost than finally, than to finally bring this conflict to an end and begin the long journey to real peace. I urge the United States government to adopt that policy. I urge my Korean friends and those of you in the audience from Korea to advocate, continue to advocate for that in your country. This is not a partisan issue, not a political issue. We're all at risk. Nuclear war is good for nobody, and that risk is real. So please continue your efforts to promote peace on the Korean Peninsula as a part of a bright, brighter future. Thank you, mahalo, and kamsamnida. 네, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dan Liff. So that was a pre-recorded video. So I don't think I have to uh, summarize that again because uh, the message uh, would resonate uh, with you. Now, uh, there are uh, people who have army uh, experiences uh, who are willing to talk about peace with us. And I think we need more uh, people uh, like uh, Mr. Lee. Uh, so I think uh, that'll be uh, a meaningful conversation uh, to find out a shared space uh, of what we mean as peace, peace, uh, peace movement uh, uh, by peace and what uh, they mean uh, by peace. Uh, so this uh, cross uh, sectoral uh, conversation uh, is necessary. Uh, do you think that Mr. Leaf uh, spent a lot of time? Uh, that is not true as well, actually. He, he uh, used exactly 16 minutes. So before introducing the next speaker, let me share with you a meaningful story. So uh, we have started this uh, Korea Peace Appeal uh, campaign three years ago today. So uh, today marks the third uh, anniversary, third year anniversary uh, of this network. And uh, we have uh, uh, called for uh, actions for peace uh, to many uh, different organizations and institutions. And uh, we have also sent letters uh, to the uh, UN Secretary General uh, for Peace on the Crimson. Uh, urging him to send a message of peace to citizens across the world. And if possible, let us uh, share that message on July 27th, Korean time, if possible. And it is grateful that this morning, uh, Korean time, uh, we have received that message from the uh, UN Secretary General, uh, which was also tweeted on his account. So before introducing uh, the next speaker, uh, let me read out uh, that uh, statement. The Korean War devastated the Korean Peninsula. The armistice agreement halted the bloodshed. For seven decades, it has served as a legal foundation for the preservation of peace and stability on the peninsula. Today, we honor the memory of all those who perished, and we share in the grief of the countless families who have been separated for so long. The Korean Peninsula remains divided amidst, amidst rising geopolitical tension increased nuclear risk and eroding respect for international norms, the threat of escalation is growing. We need a surge in diplomacy for peace. I urge the parties to resume regular diplomatic contacts and nurture an environment conducive to deep dialogue. Our goals remain clear, sustainable peace and the complete and verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula.
I look forward to our personnel and the wider international community to be allowed to return to Pyongyang following the COVID-19 pandemic. This collective return will critically contribute to better supporting the people, strengthen relations, and fortify communication channels. The United Nations is your steadfast partner as we strive to realize the vision of a Korean Peninsula in which all can enjoy peace, prosperity, and human rights. So uh, that's the message from the UN Secretary General. So, uh, you know, there is a growing criticism for the UN for not functioning very well, but uh, I appreciate this message and I uh, urge uh, the UN Secretary, Secretary General uh, to be more active for peace on the Korean Peninsula in Northeast Asia. Uh, let us now move on to the uh, fifth presentation. The speaker is Tapan Mishura. Uh, he used to be the former uh, UN resident coordinator and UNDP resident representative in, DP, in the DPRK. So he was the one who was in DPRK uh, the most recently from among us. And currently, he is the UN resident coordinator in Mongolia. In June, in Ulaanbaatar, I went to Ulaanbaatar for a a uh, meeting, a conference with the Mongolian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs on Women, Peace, and Security, and I met uh, Mr. Tapan Nishra, and I was moved by his heartfelt uh, genuine uh, affection for the Korean Peninsula, and so I begged him, I pleaded with him uh, to come to for the symposium and to speak at the symposium. As you know, uh, it's very difficult for UN officials to uh, come on a personal uh, for person for other reasons, so you have to get the uh, approval from the UN. But he did that, and he crossed so many obstacles to arrive to just this morning from Uzbekistan. Actually, he's fluent in Korean as well, so I'm sure that he will be giving you a very moving presentation today. So please welcome. Mr. Mishra with a big round of applause. Hello. Bangafsmida. I'm so uh, happy you, to meet Jihyun. all if of you. you. Allow me, because I have not slept the whole oh. night. If I can stand and speak, I can see the people better, better eye contact, and maybe change in the dynamic a little bit. Yes. We had academicians talking very strongly. We had military people talking. But now let me give you a practitioner's uh, mindset. And I know that uh, many of you have worked closely with North Korea. I know that Kim Ju has been visiting me many, many times in, in Pyongyang for her agricultural work. And she used to be known as the Yomso and Cotton uh, Guru. Right, and uh, obviously, um, Young he um, uh, has mentioned about the fact that how many of you have worked so well in in, in fostering peace and, and and diplomacy with North Korea. So, in the 15 minutes that I have, I will try to speak three things. First of all, let me give you a disclaimer. You heard the message of the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who has shared the UN's a real uh, message, strong message around peace and diplomacy. The only way forward is diplomacy uh, and not war. So we need to kind of look at that very carefully of how and what we need to. What I'm going to do is about talking for, that I'm, my disclaimer is that I'm not speaking as official UN. I'm speaking more as a practitioner who has worked perhaps for the longest time, for more than four years, more than 50 months in Pyongyang, Till date, the longest serving resident coordinator in the most challenging times when President Donald Trump and uh, uh, Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un were having their exchanges. I don't want to talk about more about those you know better than me in terms of what happened there. And I was in Pyongyang in the heart of the, uh, the possible conflicts that were there between 2015 and 2019, and at least in, in 2017 when we were on the brink of a nuclear uh, kind of a disaster before the Pyeongchang Olympics happened and the peace dialogues happened with Singapore and many other possibilities. So first of all, I'll talk about what the UN has done, since many of you talk about UN has not done much 
in terms of this. I'll talk about a little bit more what the UN has done. Second, I want to talk a little bit more in terms of my personal analysis. I don't want to talk about Bukhan. Choson. They call you Nam Choson. So, and you call him Bukhan. So, but I'll talk Hanguk and Choson huh? in respect of both countries. And Chokomamnida, uh, Muna So, I'll speak a little bit my understanding of the Korean dynamics, how the North Korean mind thinks. Because in my four years, I have been to some extent. Chokom Amnida. I have been uh, aware of how, right from children, from uh, how they are kind of uh, um, influenced by their thinking, by their story, by Iyagi, uh, uh, their stories, their um, various uh, songs and music and various uh, ways of influencing mind, how the Korean mind thinks, North Korean mind thinks. And thirdly, I will talk about a little bit more of what could be some of the causative factors that are affecting these and what are the solutions possible in terms of looking at peace and sustainable peace leading to what people are asking for, a treaty. But before we go to a treaty, we need to go to a root causes and build peace through sustainable efforts which are much deeper than transactional processes. So let me uh, share and please do uh, correct me if I'm... So I'll, in the five minutes each part. So first of all, what has the UN done? As I said, I joined in June 2015 and at that time we were launching the next uh, lead up from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals. So on the 4th of September 2015 in Pyongyang sitting in the diplomatic club along with the director we launched the Sustainable Development Goals in Pyongyang and they are looking forward to development but the point is again the history is what is there which we cannot change uh, but we can talk about we can learn from history and we can change the future. So what we try to do is around working towards a kind of a stronger strategic agreement with the government of, uh, of uh, North Korea, with uh, DPR Korea, to uh, create a United Nations strategic framework for five years of 2017 to 2021 around the Sustainable Development Goals to help them achieve that. But at the same time, in those four years, did you know, there were many six sanctions that came one after the other from 2016 onwards after every nuclear uh, uh, missile or every bomb that was uh, uh, tested, one stronger uh, um, sanction came. And due to that sanction, development agenda was completely put aside. The only work we could do at the UN is primarily humanitarian at the point in time. And as you know that in the Korean Peninsula, droughts and floods have been cyclic and therefore food production uh, the health issues, water sanitation, hygiene, and also uh, the various aspects of, uh, uh, of uh, nutrition, etc., have been affected. And therefore, we have not been able to uh, really uh, root out uh, the real causes to move to development from humanitarian support. The, what UN has done in those uh, uh, four years that I have been there is that you will see, and you can go to the DPRK UN website, and you can see the documents, and you can see some of my footprints there in terms of, on the 1st of September 2016, we signed this five-year strategic document with the government of uh, DPR Korea, with the uh, Deputy Director General for their uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs and the Secretary General of the National Committee, uh, Kim chang Win, and I, along with the all 30 UN agencies signed this document around four major strategic priorities, including food security, including social services, and including data and development management, and also uh, building resilience against disaster risk reduction. So we've created that. And in that document, if you can see that, in a country which people can try to uh, always uh, put them down around human rights, in that document, you'll see that the agreement is around human rights-based approach. The agreement is around gender equality. The agreement is around in the programming principles. You will see that it's signed by both of us as an open public document. So there has been a commitment from the government of DPR Korea when they saw that there was a positive engagement from the United Nations to help them achieve certain priorities to achieve the sustainable development goals, despite the fact the sanctions were putting down development behind for them. But we need we work together to uh, achieve the sustainable development goals through national ownership, the achieve uh, human rights-based approach, 
achieve gender equality and making sure that there was an environmental sustainability, etc. So those principles have been followed in the United Nations Strategic Framework 2017-2021. Now, unfortunately, uh, because of the COVID pandemic, I'm sure you're aware that most of the UN internationals have been um, uh, have uh, left the country and there are no internationals there. And that's why in the appeal of the Secretary General, they're appealing to the government of TPR Korea to allow UN personnel, especially international, to get back and be able to work further towards this peace. Other thing that I've, we've done very well, you notice that you can see all the humanitarian appeals every year. In, we used to publish a document called the Needs and Priorities document, along with not only the UN agencies, but also all other NGOs and civil society in Pyongyang, including the EUPS and others, um, the Red Cross, the MRCS, all put together, we created a whole uh, document called the Needs and Priorities document for every one of the four years that I was there, 2016, 17, 18, 19, there are documents there. There was one after that in 2020 as well. These are public documents. You can look at that, how we have been trying to support the people of, of, uh, of DPR Korea in achieving their humanitarian priorities, not, on, not development. Now, this is a condition of a country where such difficult situations were there, but the UN has stand, stood there and on the ground, being able to work with the government, with all the other stakeholders, together with donors and partners, trying to create an enabling environment to do, because we were precluded from doing development work, we tried to focus on humanitarian and building resilience to overcome humanitarian challenges, which could be seen as a bridge towards development. So that's something that we have done, I think, very well. So that's my part that the UN has been trying to do its best in trying to bring all parties together. As I mentioned, that during my time in 2017, many of the highest levels of the UN officials, Under Secretary General for De Department of Political Affairs, um, uh, as well as the uh, Under Secretary General for Office for Humanitarian Coordination, both visited uh, DPR Korea. And we did managed to have very high level meetings and we are able to diffuse some of the tensions at that point in time. So we have made efforts. I just want to make sure that you understand that it's not that the UN was sitting there twiddling their thumbs. We have been trying. I have also come here to uh, to um, uh, to Seoul and I have engaged with many of you in the, during my time as uh, the DPRK uh, resident coordinator in the UNDPRR to try and see how we can build the bridge around peace and prosperity. So that's the first part of my, my, my um, uh, narration to you. The second part, that UN again has been uh, strongly, because the DPRK and ROK both are members of the United Nations, and as member states, so we try and treat every member state equally. However, the North Korea does not see that, that the UN has been fair and, and, run, and they have mentioned this during our meetings at the highest levels. They've said that, why is that the UN flag is flying across what you call the UN command? Is it really the UN command or is it something else? So they still point the fingers and even when I was there and we made it very clear to us that the UN is not uh, impartial and they've been accusing us of that too. So that's something that we have seen around the way the UN is seen by DPR Korea, not as uh, equally fair and transparent to every country put together. And so these are some of the accusations that they have. And just because they're not in the room and I have to speak what I have heard on their part too because we cannot have a unilateral decision of how things happen. We need to understand both sides of to be building a treaty, we need to understand. So second part of my speech now is about understanding root causes. You see, as I was saying, that history of the Korean Peninsula not the thousands of years of the of the Goryeo dynasty and the and the Joseon dynasty, but in the last 70 years, what we've seen in the Korean War, the three years of the devastating Korean War has taught lessons to the Korean people as much as any country has suffered. The amount of suffering that has happened on both sides of the of the of the 38th parallel, and I have followed to some extent. And there's a Korean War Museum on the other side, and they have a different story to tell. I'm sure this side has a different story to tell. But whatever is the root cause of what was done, we cannot change history, as I mentioned before. We can only learn from history, so that we do not repeat history, and we can only change the future. 
And that's what I'm appealing to you today, to understand what is in their mind. What is it that they are trying to understand? And I'll tell you one story, which I have told some, some of you before, of how the Korean mind thinks about themselves. Now, I'll, I'll try to use some Korean words too. They go, kusum dochi. Kusum dochi amnika? Yeah. Hedgehog. Porcupine kashi dochi. Okay. So, you know this, uh, the, the Korean mind, the, the Iyagis are very popular. Kim, uh, Kim Il-sung has a lot of these Iyagis, the stories and, and fables that go around how the country is seen. So I was in a New Year celebration in the children's palace, and a lot of the children were doing a play acting, and they were uh, dressed up as animals, uh, deers and bears and different animals, and they're pulling and pushing each other, playing a game called Who is Stronger? Uh, so the Who's Stronger game they were playing, pulling and pushing each other. Now, in that game, suddenly they were having a lot of fun and laughter. In comes a huge tiger and a fox. And the fox tells, move away. The tiger is here. He's the king of the jungle. He's the most powerful. So make way for him. You guys get out of here. And everybody's scared. All the animals stop playing and they hide behind bushes. And they are very angry saying, how come you are bullying us? This is our, our jungle too. And then the fox says, no, no, he's the greatest, uh, he's the most powerful. So you have to, uh, you know, bow down to him and he's the, you have to uh, follow him. And the, they all get to say, this is not fair. One little hedgehog, Kusum Dochi, small hedgehog, comes up and says, no, this is not fair. We, we will fight this. He says, how can you fight? You're such a small little animal. He will hit you with one paw and you'll be dead. He says, no, so let's have a condition. We'll fight. In case I win, then the tiger will have to leave. But if the tiger wins, then fine, we'll agree whatever he says. They're up for the fight. Suddenly, the Kusum Dochi jumps up, turns around, and with the needles, hits the nose of the tiger. And the tiger is in pain and bleeding. And suddenly, the tiger says, stop, stop, I don't want to fight anymore. Right. So, the Kusum Dochi says, no, no. We agreed for a fight. And if you want to stop, then you will have to agree that you lost and you leave the jungle. He says, okay. And the tiger then stopped the fight and left the jungle. And all the other animals picked up on the, on the shoulder as a hero and hailed the little Kusum Dochi as a hero and said, wow, you are the savior. You have saved us from this tiger. So in their mind, they see themselves as Kusum Dochi. Who's the tiger? Okay, so and let's know, uh, you, you know who the other animals are, so let's not talk about that. But this is how the Korean mind thinks about themselves as Kusum Dochi. And I, I confronted them and said, you're not Kusum Dochi. Kusum Dochi is such a cute animal. You're Kobu Dochi. He says, Kobu Dochi? Okay, so, okay. So Kobu Dochi, uh, I said, yeah, you're a combination of Kobugi, a tortoise, and Kashi Dochi, like a, a porcupine. So combined together, in peace times, you're covered, protected, insulated, isolated. But in times of reaction, when you see other military actions happening, your spikes go up and you become reactive. And so they are, you're a kashi dochi. And they agreed with me. So I think that's why we need to move forward to think and understand. So let's move, since I have only a minute more, to let me move from their thinking to what's the solution. Now, solution is certainly not war. If the Korea could withstand the three years of Korean war without a nuclear warhead or without a missile. Today, I don't think that's going to be easy to say that, oh, we can beat them by, uh, by war. And you've seen in the current years that we have seen bigger powers engaged in war. Wars don't give solutions. Wars are lose-lose. Win-win, we have to think. So, so one option, war is not the answer. Number two is that Status quo. Status quo is not the answer because we've done it for 70 years. We've not find anything moving forward. Third is that we a say that we will look, go to a peace accord, but peace accord doesn't need to, it cannot happen overnight. We need to understand these root causes. The deepest issue between the Koreas is a distrust and the mistrust that you have created over the years. The way that they look at you is more that you have betrayed them, gone with the tiger. And also, <laughs> no? so, so you have been on the other side, you have supported that. So that has to change. There has to be a very long process.
process of diplomacy, of engagement on a genuine basis to create the trust, or recreate and rebuild that trust. Many uh, sunshine events have happened, many initiatives have happened, and not many of them have really created this uh, real results that we have wanted to see on a sustainable basis. But I personally believe, I'm an eternal optimist. I've seen that when we, we go with a genuine effort, the people in North Korea have responded very positively. People, the governments, etc. So I, I certainly, I'm an optimist and I believe that it's possible but we need to go with genuine efforts. If we go to them, oh, poor little North Koreans who can't get their food, etc., that kind of mindset will not help. We need to go with respect, with friendship, with uh, uh, openness and, and, and genuine um, um, intent to have a peace treaty. I believe that option four, which is about a, a unification, Tongil, not possible, because I don't think you have outgrown, although your culture and everything is similar, your deepest mindset is similar, but because you have outgrown in different directions, uh, uh, having a unified Korea does not seem to be a possibility. What is possible is a, a Korean Union or a Korean Confederation where the Koreas can live like the European Union together in harmony and peace and together create prosperity for all in the Korean Peninsula through peace and prosperity through a Korean Union. So that's the way perhaps we need to go and approach the baby steps and create that enabling condition of trust, respect, mutual understanding, and confidence building measures that can create. For my part, since the time is over, I could have gone over and over again. I'll give you the last Iyagi, the story of the Keron egg. You know, You've seen many of places where you have put pressure from outside, countries have cracked. You've seen Iraq, you've seen Libya, many other countries, and they're seeing that. So putting external pressure on a country is like an egg. If you put pressure from outside, egg breaks, and you can only make an omelet or a fried egg, right? But if you create enabling conditions, you give it warmth and you hatch the egg, out comes the beginning of life as against the end of life. So my appeal to you and to all the leaders from both sides of the 38 parallel and the DMZ is so let's look at as people of Korea's and the people of the world, how can we create that enabling environment to create peace and trust? Peace will only come through trust and dialogue and diplomacy. That's the only way forward. War is not the answer. Peace will come through dialogue, engagement and diplomacy and not through confrontation. So if you can create the enabling environment, I, I, I personally believe, as I said, as an eternal optimist, it can be created as an opportunity to create peace and, and harmony and prosperity in the Korean Peninsula. Pyongha Baramnida, Huamok Baramnida, Hangbok Baramnida, Kungang Baramnida. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. We can't change the history, but we can learn from history to change the future. So with a positive attitude, with the strength of the solidarity of peoples of the world, let's start building peace on the Korean Peninsula. I agree with everything, but I don't know if the South Korean government would agree. So we've had five Five speakers talk about where we are and where we should be headed. And we also have with us participants from on YouTube who have given us some, sent us some questions. On page 36 of uh, Kim Jun Professor Kim Jun Young's uh, uh, presentation, and there was uh, the slide on multilateralism and uh, multiple multi-layered solidarity. Could you speak a little bit more about that, since you weren't able to because of time constraints? All right. As everyone has mentioned, actually, I'm more pessimistic. I lie awake at night worrying about the future of on the Korean Peninsula, so I don't want to talk about false hope. When Prigojin was, uh, raised a coup d'etat, started a coup d'etat, in within just three hours, we heard that news. So I think even the, the tiniest bit of action will spread and as news around the world in a matter of hours. 
And as you know, uh, the governments in China and in North Korea, they are authoritarian governments. And much less, needless to say, the South Korean government is also uh, very authoritarian and far right. But uh, but it has the obligation, constitutional duty to protect uh, its citizens. But that's not what it's doing. It's becoming chummier and chummier with the United States and uh, Japan instead and continuing to be very unfriendly towards uh, North Korea as well as China. And they are acting out of self-interest, and they're working for the interests of the ruling class or the elite. But we have to show them uh, that we are not supportive, the people are not supportive of this idea. And we have to show that not only to South Korean government, but to North Korea and to China. And we have to show the world that what the South Korean government is doing right now is not, does not have our support. And I think even the tiniest voice in that direction will ring out, resonate around the world. So the more pessimistic we think the situation, uh, we are about the situation, we have to try even harder to find seeds of hope and try to expand those seeds, grow those seeds. And I believe that those seeds exist all around the world, in Europe in the United, and the United States even. And the U.S. hegemony is the problem of those in power, but the business people, uh, and there will be many people, even in the United States, who are opposed to this uh, U.S.-China rivalry because it hurts their lives and their business. So the people's voice uh, might be saying something very different from their governments. It's the same in Europe. They, there will be many people who don't agree to NATO's actions. So the superpowers, they will not use, they, they are using uh, Ukraine and even uh, the Korean Peninsula as their buffer zone, but we have to disagree to this, oppose this, and show, uh, ring out our opposing voices as much as possible. Yes, thank you. So uh, it's time that we have to move on to the next session. So I'm going to uh, let the uh, speakers to make a one minute closing comment. Professor Kim sung kyung please go ahead first. Uh, you're going to uh, waive your time to other speakers. So, Mr. Uh, Tafan Mishura, I think you uh, you can now uh, think about your last comment uh, and uh, uh, make your uh, own comment after listening to uh, Mr. Uh, Keith uh, Ruth um, for your uh, closing. Well, thank you. And uh, it's been my privilege to listen in and to uh, visit with some old friends on the panel and some new friends as well who have been a part of this conference. I just want to say that um, overall, long term, I'm optimistic that there can be a peaceful resolution to the situation on the peninsula between the North and the South. One of the reasons that I'm optimistic is because of the commitment of so many people, such as those represented in today's conference, who are willing to take a long view of the situation, who acknowledge that the differences cannot be resolved uh, over a, a short period of time. You know, denuclearization is often uh, a key topic uh, from the United States perspective, and it's an important topic. But there are so many other issues of interest to Americans and to North Korea, to South Korea uh, as well. And I really appreciate this conference because it provides opportunity to talk about peace, to talk about solutions, possible solutions, uh, in ways that encompass a, a wide range of topics. So thank you. And I want to commend the organizers of the conference uh, for having put this together. 감사합니다.
Thank you very much for your comment. Now, Mr. Tapan Mishura, uh, back in 2019, uh, authored uh, a report on humanitarian assistance uh, to the UN, and he certainly has a passion uh, for the Korean Peninsula. One uh, last comment uh, for one minute, please. Thank you, Ji-Hyung. Uh, my last one minute yeah, comment is about what I said before uh, in a different way that to build peace and go to a peace treaty, it'll need to take a different approach. What has not worked, if you keep trying the same thing, will not work, right? Einstein said that, if you're trying to solve the same problem by the same way, which has not worked, it's not gonna help that. So we need to think through, what is it? So therefore, we need to do a little bit more analysis in terms of what we need to do differently to be able to really create that bridge with the other side of the 38th parallel with the DPR Korea to see that they see the genuineness they don't see a kind of falsehoods in either part from that side to the side. It'll need a lot of approach from both sides through diplomacy, through engagement, through dialogue, and through well-coordinated efforts throughout. So from government to government, from people to people, from civil society to civil society, from private sector to private sector, in different ways. So we need to go through a very very well-coordinated and well-structured well process through that for peace building. It will not happen overnight. I personally am very committed to do whatever little I can to contribute towards that. But I appeal to all of you, and I appeal to those people in a democracy like uh, ROK, people have different voices. But I want people to say that your all safety, security, well-being is threatened by the hanging war, the, the sword of Democles that any nuclear confrontation is disastrous, not only for the Korean Peninsula, but for the world. So we cannot afford to have this risk hanging on our head. We need to make more concerted efforts together, whole of society, whole of government effort towards peace in a very genuine and concerted way. Kam samneda. Thank you very much. So I'm uh, listening to the uh, uh, speeches of the panelists in this session. We have uh, once again reminded ourselves of the strong role of peoples in uh, making sure peace in the history of uh, humankind. And uh, it has always uh, been the commitment of global citizens uh, who cross borders uh, to promote human rights, peace, democracy, sustainable development, uh, labor rights, and uh, gender equality. We are living in this era of uh, crisis with uh, the unprecedented complexities of interconnections and also uh, on the Korean Peninsula uh, where the war is still uh, going on uh, and um, I believe that was a great uh, was a great time uh, for us to re-examine where we stand. When we say peace is a process in practice, and a state uh, does not fulfill its responsibility to uh, ensure that, it is the citizens uh, who uh, have to uh, stand up uh, and uh, play their role. Uh, in a conference two days ago, Mr. Rhino Brown uh, said, that there is uh, the war logic and there is the peace logic in the world. We have to overcome the uh, war, the logic of war in uh, division, uh, and pursue uh, the logic of peace uh, and uh, cooperation. We need to come up with uh, practical ways that cross the boundaries and borders, and 
make a long-term commitment in solidarity with the citizens across the world. I'd like to express my gratitude uh, to the uh, speakers here in this room and joining us online uh, despite the uh, time difference. And I'd like to thank all the audience here in this room and joining us online uh, from across the world who have shared their insights and voices uh, for peace. And in any uh, conference like this, there are the staffs uh, who put together uh, uh, these uh, events with uh, sleepless nights. Please give a big hand uh, to all of them. And uh, there are interpreters who are helping us to overcome the language barriers uh, who are uh, in uh, back there in the room with us. Please give a big hand to them as well. Now we're going to have a 10-minute break. And once again, I thank the speakers uh, in the audience for staying with us uh, so far. And uh, after a 10-minute break, uh, we'll resume the discussion at 4.30. And for the speakers of the first session, uh, we'll have a commemorative photo. Thank you very much. Now, I'm not getting your audio very clearly, but can you hear?
예, 잠시 후 2분 뒤 4시 30분에 두 번째 세션 정전 70년 한반도 동아시아 평화를 위한 노력과 희망 시작하겠습니다. 2분 뒤에 시작하겠습니다. 어, 휴식을 마치신 분들은 자리에 앉아주시면 고맙겠습니다. 네, 에, 오늘 진행을 맡은 어, 분들 토론하실 분들은 앞으로 나와서 명패 뒤에 앉아주시면 고맙겠습니다. 곧 2부 세션 시작하도록 하겠습니다. 예, 예정된 시간이 되었습니다. 어, 두 번째 세션 정년 70년 한반도 동아시아 평화를 위한 노력과 희망 이제 시작하려고 합니다. 오늘 토론을 맡아주신 분들은 앞에 자리에 나와서 명패 뒤에 앉아주시면 고맙겠습니다. 어, 앞서 첫 번째 세션에서 에, 각 분야에서 여러 경험을 가진 분들로부터 우리는 어디에 있고 어디로 가고 있는지에 대해서 의견을 들어보았습니다. 에, 두 번째 세션은 에, 희망에 대해서 특히 평화의 희망에 대해서 그리고 우리가 가야 될 길에 대해서 좀더 구체적으로 말하는 시간입니다. 어, 이번 세션의 사회를 맡은 저는 정전 70년 한반도 평화행동에서 공동집행위원장을 맡고 있고 또 마찬가지로 참여연대에서 평화국지센터 소장을 맡고 있는 이태호입니다. 반갑습니다. 앞서 어, 1세션에서 김성경 선생님께서 우리는 연결되어 있다 이렇게 말씀해 주셨습니다. 예, 그래서 어, 우리가 지난 3년간 어떻게 스스로를 연결해 왔는지 우리가 우리의 목소리를 어떻게 모아왔고 또 높여왔는지 음, 돌아보고 또 앞으로 가야 될 길에 대해서 얘기하는 세션입니다. 처음 3년 전에 저희가 코리아 피스 어필 캠페인을 시작할 때는 어, 오늘 우리가 맡고 있는 상황이 지금보다는 좀 나을 것으로 기대했었습니다. 어, 그런데 어, 지금은 많이 어렵다고들 하죠. But today many people are saying the situation is challenging. But when it's most challenging to talk about peace, uh, it is most urgent to talk about peace. The governments are now exercising for war and increasing their dependence on nuclear weapons. Now is the time that 
it is most urgent uh, for the governments uh, to engage in negotiations for peace and the, peop uh, and the people to take action for peace. As you may well know, the Korea Peace Appeal campaign is not a domestic campaign, but a dom global campaign. And it is a campaign uh, that involves not just a civil uh, society, uh, but also uh, the political uh, parties, the religious communities, and so on. It's not just about the Korean Peninsula. It is also uh, about the fight against militarism. And relative to the time we are given for the session. So I'm going to give each speaker seven minutes only. I'm deeply sorry for giving them uh, only seven minutes. In fact, uh, to be honest, I wish they could be more brief than seven minutes. Uh, now, I don't think I need to introduce each and one of them because they are well known for their uh, commitment and dedication. So uh, they will share uh, what they are thinking about uh, where we need to uh, be uh, headed. So the first uh, speaker is uh, one of the uh, uh, first uh, people who proposed for the uh, Korea Peace Action. Uh, and uh, who is uh, one of the busiest uh, today, uh, Hwang Su-young from the Korea Peace Action. Uh, Hello, my name is Hwang Su Young. I was given seven minutes. And the paper that I uh, submitted for the source book is in here in the book in the book, so you can read that for yourself. Sorry that I was not able we were not able to uh, translate it into English for the book itself. But I won't be uh, reading that. I will be giving you a brief summary of the, what we've been doing and the results that we have achieved so far, produced so far, at, from through the peace, Korea Peace Appeal campaign. I don't think I need to introduce the campaign itself since we are all together on this campaign and we are well aware of what we've been up to. As you know, uh, we started in 2020, and we've been going on for about three years. And this year, we have the added slogan of 70th anniversary of the Korean War armistice. We started. One here in this hall and joining us uh, on YouTube. So commemorating the 70th anniversary of the armistice, we want to end the war. That was our call, initial call, and now we have broadened it and deepened it into no war, no more war. Uh, we will not accept any war. So let's end the ongoing war and change it into a peace treaty. And we have been critical of the military alliance uh, between the three countries, uh, Japan, the US, and South Korea. And we have been calling for dialogue. And we have been uh, working very hard to explore paths towards uh, this dialogue, openings for this dialogue. So we've been continuing with the collecting signature uh, signature collecting drive, and this year uh, we will be delivering, sending all these the signatures that we had collected together with the petition to the UN, to the UN Secretariat, and those are the plans for the future. 
and this last Saturday as well as this morning at Imjingak where we had the press conference, many of it. Pe many people were with us, and about 700 uh, CSOs, as well as the 70 nominations of the uh, Christian groups in uh, religious denominations in uh, Korea. Uh, they are all together on this uh, network, the Kore uh, Korean Peninsula Peace Action. So it's the largest and widest global network working to end the Korean War. And so looking back, uh, let us, I'd like to uh, highlight certain points of what, how far we've come. Our main objective was to get people, as many people as possible, to know, become aware that the war is still going on on the Korean Peninsula, that it has not ended. And that this uh, problem should not be couched as a nuclear problem of the United uh, of North Korea, but a problem uh, that is challenging uh, permanent peace, uh, impeding peace on the Korean Peninsula and the Northeast Asian region. And so uh, we've had uh, people connecting, connected uh, through networks, and we have held uh, webinars, and we have uh, strengthened solidarity, and our strategy has been to have one single slogan, one uniform and united slogan that would, they will all, that we will all uphold wherever we go, wherever we are around the world. And so that's what people have been doing. So 300 uh, peace actions have been taken all around the world in the space of a few months. So that strategy was successful. And our ambitious uh, goal was to collect one million uh, signatures, which was quite a symbolic uh, goal. And the ordinary citizens, uh, they can't, there isn't much that they can do in terms of uh, actions in their everyday life. So that's why uh, we, for starters, we had this signature collecting drive, which is easy for ordinary citizens to participate in. They don't have to read up a lot or join a CSO. Uh, it's an easy way to do it. And so we have about 170 signatures to date from around the world, and we have used made use of social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and all that. Uh, and we've uh, and we our postings have been viewed, and we have a mailing list of about two hundred thousand people who receive our bulletin and news from of the Peace, Korea Peace Appeal campaign regularly. And we. One of another strategy that we had was collecting all the people's uh, efforts uh, and sh showing that all on one page, so where we can see at one glance that so many people around the world are with us on in this campaign at various levels, even parliamentarian levels. And the uh, we have also uh, strengthened solidarity and connections with many uh, organizations, uh, Korean uh, religious groups, and even art groups, and uh, charities like the Beautiful Foundation. And they have all uh, been generously supporting uh, this campaign and this network because they were supportive of the, uh, our goals and our activities. So of course, I cannot but mention uh, the Friedrich Ebert Friedrich, uh, Foundation as well. So uh, it was through these such support and active participation uh, that we were able to hold this campa campaign and keep this campaign running for three years. And, uh, and this will all culminate in a report uh, that we will be sending officially to the U United Nations in October, this coming October. So we have to overcome uh, the armistice and move towards permanent peace and also a peace treaty. And so we have to continue our efforts. We cannot uh, just take a break here. 
and the ambition and enthusiasm is still there. Uh, we don't know uh, the uh, in detail what we the plans that we will be uh, carrying out in the future, but we will uh, encourage all the people who are with us in this network to do what they can starting with the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, and uh, continue in whatever way they can, even with very small deeds or actions, uh, to, con to keep going. And that's our mindset right now. And as on your way up to this building, uh, you had, I'm sure you saw that small rally that was happening under the sun. Uh, uh, condemning uh, the North Korean regime, uh, regime. And we want to actively participate in this discourse that is raging right now over what is true peace and what is fake peace. And I think we continue, we need to continue to make our voices heard. And that's something we all here need to do. Okay, so that sums up uh, what we are thinking of doing and what we have done at this, uh, f through the Korea Peace Appeal Campaign. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Because of time constraints, I will refrain from speaking as the moderator and give more time to the panelists. So in session two, You'll be able to learn about the uh, civil society initiatives uh, going on, uh, you know, that uh, are mostly uh, relying on the next speaker, Ms. Mary Joyce. Uh, the Northeast Asia Regional uh, Liaison Officer of uh, JPEG and International Coordinator of Peace Boat. Uh, she was uh, also a uh, Peace uh, and Friendship Ambassador for the Korean Peninsula of the Ministry of Unification. Uh, Ms. Joyce, please go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you all today. Uh, my name is Mary Joyce, and I'm based at a Japanese NGO called Peace Boat, where I work to coordinate particularly the Northeast Asia Regional Network of GPAC, which is a global network of local peace building organizations. And we're very honored to be part of uh, the campaign and here today. And first of all, thank you so much to everybody involved in the Korea Peace Appeal for all your sleepless nights and very challenging days uh, in bringing us all here together at this important timing, especially Suyong. <laughs> and your voices really to remind the world that the Korean War is not over and that its impacts are still going on today, that 70 years are enough. These efforts are crucial, and so we're here today in solidarity and to find ways that we can somehow support each other in these very long efforts as well. As GPAC Northeast Asia, our main priority is an activity that we call the Ulaanbaatar Process, which is an inclusive civil society dialogue for peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula, uh, co-organized by GPAC and, as you heard uh, earlier this afternoon, the Mongolian NGO Blue Banner, led by Ambassador Ensaihan, who shared some words earlier. This process was launched in 2015 in Mongolia, and it includes participation regularly from both the DPRK and the ROK, together also with civil society members from Beijing, Hong Kong, Kyoto, Taipei, Tokyo, Ulaanbaatar, Vladivostok, and the United States, as well as other regional partners. And some of these members are also uh, joining us here today. In the interest of time, I won't share too much detail about this, but there's some background information in the booklet which has been handed out. I won't be reading a speech from there, though. So it might only be on a very small scale, but we're glad that this Ulaanbaatar process has become a standing and a sustained platform that's able to regularly bring together civil society representatives from both the Koreas and beyond to meet and engage with each other in peace dialogues, even at times when inter-Korean relations have been at a complete stall or when tensions are extremely high. Unfortunately, with the current border closures during the pandemic, we've not been able to meet in person with our DPRK partners uh, since late 2019, as of course is the same for uh, others. However, we remain in regular contact online and they share our commitment and dedication to continuing to work together and with the other partners as well. So GPAC is very glad to be a partner of the Korea Peace Appeal and to find ways to support and to collaborate with local peace builders in Korea for this campaign and other initiatives that are sharing the same goals. 
it's all the more important at times like we have now, where tensions are high and opinions are so divided that we can find ways to have a common voice for peace and to explore different approaches that could potentially somehow pave the way for dialogue to be reopened or expanded. Your efforts and the, those of others to highlight the real human impacts of this war that are still going on today are having global waves. Uh, so while our process was founded in 2015, partners from Pyongyang have been actively taking part in our network since 2010, uh, which was also the year when I first uh, personally traveled to the DPRK. As someone coming from Australia, a country which of course also participated in the Korean War, and based in Japan, which bears a heavy historical responsibility for the colonization and the aggression on the Korean Peninsula and in the broader Asian region, Asia Pacific region, I feel an obligation to find some kind of small piece in the puzzle to contribute. Uh, thinking back to these, these early days when we started this work, I won't forget the moments uh, during the first time that delegation from Pyongyang attended our regional meeting in person. This was in March 2011, and it was just actually about two weeks after the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami and the subsequent Fukushima nuclear disaster. Uh, Peace Boat, our organization, was deeply engaged in the emergency relief efforts at the time. We were coordinating thousands of volunteers in the impacted areas, struggling with the devastation of the nuclear disaster at the time. And in the middle of this chaos, we were debating about whether it was even possible or worthwhile to go ahead and hold this meeting, both as an organization, but also for us personally as, as the staff as well. But I remember when we arrived at the meeting and sat down together at the table for the first time on sort of a side conversation with the participants from both Seoul and from Pyongyang at the first time, and actually Lee Tae-ho was one of the people <laughs> there at the time. The fact that because we had this regional gathering of NGOs made it possible for them to be able to come together in this way. And the fact that me, even though I don't speak Korean at all, the fact that I was sitting there at the table with them meant that this conversation conversation between people from both Koreas was possible. Thinking ab about this small thing made me realize the power of people working together and also the need to persevere even during very difficult or adverse circumstances. Since then, of course, we've all had to face many challenges. As everyone here knows very keenly, we're at a very extremely dangerous crossroads where the risk of miscalculation or miscommunication could have dire consequences. But it's at such times of serious deadlock that it's vital that we do share strategies and ideas for ways to somehow break through and find ways to use all available means to promote dialogue. Uh, as GPEC, we believe that one important uh, element here is the regional approach. Where it's politically impossible to bring together different ashkas on a bilateral level, this regional approach is a way that safe and constructive space for dialogue can be created. A shared narrative is essential to make joint steps towards sustaining peace. And it may be easier to outline this through a regional context rather than a more contested bilateral one. For example, while discussion on denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula may be very sensitive, it's easier sometimes to share visions towards common objectives in a regional context, such as the creation of a Northeast Asian nuclear weapon-free zone. And the setting of Mongolia with its single state nuclear weapon-free status can provide a role model showing creative or alternative ways to ensure security. We all know that peace is also only possible when there's cooperation between different stakeholders. Cooperation and coordination between people approaching this from different perspectives, as we've heard today, is vital. And in this regard, I'd really like to emphasize the need for those institutions that have the capacity to, to play an even more active role in convening together civil society, regional actors, the UN, and local and national governments to coordinate actions better in a way that will be sustained beyond particular government policies and to ensure a stronger impact of building peace. Within the situation that we have today, it may sometimes be difficult to remember the spirit of hope that was maybe shared with us a few years ago, but it's so important that we don't let this go. We have to somehow actively work together to find this hope, to remind ourselves that peace is possible and to share both the challenges but also the progress that we're making along the way as well. We all know that this is a very long road uh, and it's already 70 years is far too long, but we hope to continue to work together and finally end the Korean War. Thank you. Yeah. 
메르시가 말씀하신 그 시기가 Uh, so, um, so Mary uh, just talked uh, about uh, what happened in uh, 2011, uh, 2013, and afterwards. Uh, that was actually in the aftermath of the uh, uh, Korean uh, naval uh, patrol ship uh, sinking and uh, many other critical events. And I also take pride in uh, being able to make progress uh, in peace dialogue uh, with people like Mary. Uh, let's move on uh, to the uh, next speaker, uh, Ms. Cheona, uh, Secretary General of the South Korean Committee for the Implementation of the June 15th uh, Joint uh, Declaration. Now, to introduce uh, this organization a little bit uh, for you, uh, uh, this is a uh, coalition of South Korean, North Korean, uh, and uh, international uh, civil society uh, for the implementation of the uh, joint declaration. Nice to meet you. I'm Cheona. It's great to um, be invited uh, in this symposium. So uh, just like uh, the uh, moderator uh, said, I represent the uh, South Korean Committee. Uh, so today, uh, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, organization and uh, about the need uh, to create a conducive environment for political dialogue for peace, starting from social and cultural exchanges. Now, uh, the name of the organization uh, has expression, the implementation of the June 15th Joint Declaration. Uh, certainly, let me focus on uh, that part. Uh, so, as explained earlier, uh, the organization has three committees, the so South Korean Committee, the North Korean Committee, and the uh, International Committee. And uh, the three committees uh, regularly uh, meet together at least once, up to four times a year, uh, to make common decisions. Uh, unfortunately, after the uh, failure in Hanoi uh, and the uh, rising tensions in the inter-Korean relations, we are not able to have uh, that regular meetings, but uh, we are finding other ways to stay in contact. So well, we are basically an organization for all Koreans living in the North and the South uh, or overseas uh, to fight for peace and unification. And we believe that it is important to uh, involve Koreans in all uh, sectors. Uh, that's why uh, all three committees uh, have uh, various sections uh, under them, uh, comprising uh, the youth, uh, women, uh, and so on. So uh, the organization uh, started with social and uh, cultural exchanges uh, between the North and the South. Now these photos uh, are old, uh, partly because we uh, have been unable to have uh, such exchanges for so many years. Now, these are uh, from uh, Mount Kumgangsan uh, and uh, youth events and uh, joint um, efforts of the uh, Buddhist community to restore a uh, Buddhist uh, temple. Uh, there were also uh, soccer games of workers uh, in Pyongyang, and there was a uh, joint uh, mass in the uh, Changchun Cathedral, and uh, there was also an event of uh, writers uh, who uh, came together in uh, Mount Pekdusan. There have been also cultural events in Seoul, Busan, Gwangju, and Incheon, uh, where uh, representatives of North Korea uh, came together uh, for cultural uh, performances, and uh, there was also a marathon uh, organized on the Jeju Island. I believe all these events and occasions have contributed to deepen the understanding uh, between the two sides. And these were not mere encounters. Uh, they always culminated in joint statements. 
So we wanted to make sure that these events uh, are not limited to one-off events, uh, but an opportunity uh, to overcome the differences and uh, set a common vision for uh, peace and unification and raise uh, public awareness at the same time. So with uh, these uh, results, we believed uh, that uh, we can narrow uh, the gap uh, between uh, the progressive, progressives and the conservatives in South Korea and between the South and the North. We have experienced uh, those successes uh, of reaching a consensus or a compromise, overcoming uh, small differences uh, between the two sides. And we are sure that uh, such efforts will continue uh, to uh, make uh, the same contribution. Now, uh, these exchanges and events are conducive uh, to creating political environment for peace and uh, unification. So uh, we have continued uh, such activities, and uh, recently uh, we uh, urged uh, the uh, South Korean government and the U.S. government uh, to lift the sanctions against uh, North Korea, uh, stop the uh, joint military exercises, and sending uh, anti-North uh, flyers. And uh, what we are uh, prioritizing uh, is uh, involving people from all the different sectors uh, of society. So um, for the last uh, few years, uh, we have collected uh, signatures uh, for petitions for peace and organized uh, joint uh, statements of NGOs and uh, grassroots organizations uh, for peace uh, and uh, unification. We have about 4,000 such uh, statements uh, so far based on grassroots uh, debate. And I believe all these efforts uh, contribute uh, to the successful activities uh, conducted under the name of uh, the Korea Peace Appeal. Now there are more than uh, 300 uh, Korea Peace Appeal initiatives going on uh, across the world. Uh, which are very much encouraging uh, for us. And uh, we will uh, continue our campaign uh, in this direction. Uh, just like Mr. Mishura said uh, in the previous session, it is important to see what the other side want uh, to create uh, real peace. Uh, in that sense, uh, we um, are uh, making demands uh, to stop antagonizing North Korea with an understanding that uh, North Korea has experienced decades of uh, decades of isolation uh, in threat. Uh, I believe uh, that uh, these uh, advocacy uh, activities uh, will help create the momentum for dialogue between uh, uh, governments. Uh, and in order to fight uh, the formation of the new Cold War regime, uh, we are working to reinforce civil society solidarity. In the last three years, uh, Korea Peace Action uh, has experienced uh, close cooperation and uh, solidarity among many different NGOs. But um, the peninsula remains divided. So we are uh, planning uh, for 2025, uh, which uh, would be the 18th anniversary of the national division. So we believe a true liberation is yet to uh, take place, uh, and uh, we uh, need to um, work on uh, the uh, national challenges uh, that are yet to be resolved. Thank you. So, um, you know, 
Many people uh, ask questions about what the uh, civilians can do uh, when the tensions are high. But I believe the history uh, of the uh, Joint Committee for implementation of the June 15th Joint Declaration uh, actually demonstrates uh, that the organization was born out of the difficulties uh, in inter-Korean relations. And actually, uh, the Minister of Unification of South Korea visited North Korea utilizing uh, this uh, civilian exchange uh, occasion. And um, other uh, high officials visited uh, North Korea uh, afterwards that ultimately uh, led to the uh, October 4th uh, Joint Declaration. So I believe that uh, civilian exchanges uh, have a lot of potential for creating new chapters of history. Uh, please give another big hand to uh, Cheyona, uh, who have uh, committed herself for uh, the last 20 years uh, to this uh, exchange. Let me introduce uh, the next speaker. Someone who has also been working for 20 years digging the same single well. He has been uh, in charge of North Korea humanitarian aid at World Vision and many other uh, international organizations. Uh, I'd like to introduce Lee Ju Sung, who is the Secretary General of the Korea NGO Council for Cooperation with North Korea. Hello, I'm Lee Ju Sung, as introduced. I'm very happy to be with so many people here today. I mean, the faces too. And as an activist in the field, we have Dr. Kim Pil Ju, uh, President Kim Pil Park Ju Sung. You are all here, and I've been I've benefited so much from your advice and your uh, examples. But despite all your efforts and our efforts to follow in your footsteps, we are still seeing so much tension between the two Koreas and so much challenges in just offering humanitarian uh, aid to North Korea. But we still have to continue with cooperation to improve the humanitarian crisis in North Korea, and we have to take it one step further and uh, establish uh, peace, uh, a foundation for peace. And I think that, yes, we have been doing that, and I'm proud of that. And I, I believe that the humanitarian assistance that we have been providing uh, to North Korea has been part of the peace campaign, part of the peace anti-war movement. And I think that what we have done is like empirical uh, evidence and data about how beneficial uh, inter-Korean cooperation is. That's what makes us sustain these efforts and keeps us here on this path. Looking back, uh, we have looking back, we have uh, 70 years since the uh, since we took the very first step to end the war, but it's still an armistice, and we, the road ahead see is uh, surrounded by fog. But I believe that humanitarian uh, activities are still needed, and by engaging in that, we are staying on this path. However, the current administration is making use of this as a, for, uh, as a way or leverage for uh, uh, negotiations. And right now, because the inter-Korean relations are frozen up, uh, we are not able to step even one step forward in continuing with this humanitarian movement. And I think we have, as we look into the future, we have to change uh, the way we think. Uh, our mentality or attitude towards uh, North Korea has to change. It's not a unilateral kind of giving or sharing uh, and uh, unilateral uh, humanitarian aid to uh, North Korea. It has to become, uh, North Korea is no longer just a beneficiary. Uh, we have to have uh, mutual cooperation and our, our the fields in which we cooperate has to diversify uh, to prevent epidemics and pandemics in the future and also to uh, 
so in terms of healthcare, for example, and, and environment, climate crisis, uh, we have to continue to cooperate with North Korea. And as you know, we face so many obstacles uh, because of the sanctions vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea in cr continuing with our humanitarian assistance. And but so we are simplifying all the institutions and channels, and that we welcome. And we are hoping uh, that the window for humanitarian uh, uh, movement will be open, not just to the state, but to the civilian organizations as well, so that we can continue uh, to for with interactions with North Koreans. And we need to come together and we have come together to create indexes and build solidarity among the, all the international and civilian organizations uh, that are working with North Korea for humanitarian assistance. And I, we, we all really hope that this uh, solidarity will be sustained into the future and that North Korea will come to that table, come to that meeting. And we hope that we will be able to overcome uh, the uh, suffering that was imposed on us because of this armistice and national division. And I hope that we want the North Korean and South Korean authorities uh, to take up that mantle, to continue with these peace efforts, and to step up uh, the commitment uh, to cooperation. And along the way, the civilian uh, organizations will be with them every step of the way. Thank you. Thank you very much. And a bigger thank you because you kept to your time limit. And I applaud your courage in shortening your uh, speech. Uh, we are telecasting uh, this conference live on YouTube, and we have about 80 people who are joining us online. So if you have any questions, as we announced uh, at the beginning of the conference, please post your questions or comments on the chat box, and we will try to collect all those questions and comments. And pose them to the panelists. We have many religious leaders who are praying for uh, peace on the Korean Peninsula and uh, calling out for uh, more dialogue instead of confrontation. And now it's uh, the turn of the politicians in Korea as well as other countries to heed that call and respond uh, to that call. So that was is one of our motives in opening this conference. So we have with us on the panel a politician. So uh, we have uh, Mr. Kim hong a member of the uh, National Assembly, and, uh, and also a member of the uh, Committee on Foreign Affairs and Unification, a member of the Democratic Party as well. Please welcome Mr. Kim. So um, last week, uh, we had a uh, hearing on the appointee of uh, Unis Uni Uni uh, Minister of uh, Unification. And a few weeks ago, the president himself uh, said that those who talk about um, end of the war declaration uh, is enemy of state. You know, actually, I uh, was uh, one of the people uh, who visited uh, the U.S. Congress uh, to g gain support uh, for uh, and end of the war declaration. So I ask this question to the appointee uh, about whether I belong to uh, the enemy of state. And his answer was no. So uh, I am confused a little bit of my identity. So now uh, there are people uh, visiting uh, the United States uh, to uh, work with uh, Koreans uh, living there. 
uh, who are um, engaging in uh, advocacy efforts uh, to put pressure on the U.S. politicians in a uh, uh, in an event commemorating the 70th anniversary of the armistice. So. Um, uh, today, uh, let me uh, share with you about what is happening uh, surrounding the Korean Peninsula based on my uh, experience and observation of the last few years. So to put it briefly, the U.S. Uh, pressurizing on North Korea uh, has been failing in the last 30 years, but the U.S. administration is totally unprepared to try something new. It seems that they are still um, believing that North Korea would collapse one day. You know, the U.S. Uh, um, you know, uh, sanctioned uh, Cuba in uh, Iran for 60 and 40 years, respectively. But uh, there was no progress at all. In the last three years, North Korea almost closed uh, its own borders and uh, you know, uh, in, uh, conducting sanctions against itself. However, uh, North Korea is more advanced than ever uh, in its uh, ICBM technology. It is not recognizable any longer uh, in advance using solid fuel. And compared to the uh, technology of other countries like China uh, or others, uh, North Korea's uh, ICBM technology uh, is very highly advanced, so worrisome. So I think uh, President Trump's approach to meet with Kim Jong-un, uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un, uh, in person was a good thing. And um, the, what, what is regrettable uh, is that he should have chosen uh, a small deal in Hanoi uh, in order to make small steps uh, towards uh, nuclear denuclearization, but uh, Trump uh, made a wrong choice uh, to uh, turn the tables against turn the table against uh, the uh, peace uh, momentum. And Chairman Kim uh, was uh, shocked uh, by that uh, failure, and it is difficult to see uh, in North Korea anyone who is favorable uh, for a uh, peace process. Now, uh, Chairman Kim is almost surrounded uh, by his loyals who are only interested in protecting the regime itself. Uh, today, North Korea, uh, the North Korean regime is almost negotiation phobic. They have a trauma of the failure of Hanoi. And any similar attempt would result in failure again. So um, this is what I heard uh, recently. Uh, there was an EU uh, institution uh, that sent uh, official letters to uh, a, a North Korean embassy in Europe, and there was no answer at all. And later they found out that they actually didn't report that fact of receiving the letter uh, to Pyongyang at all. Uh, it's because uh, the North Korean of officials in that embassy was afraid of receiving any orders uh, to act on that letter. So they chose to uh, neglect that uh, in the first place. And President Yoon unnecessarily made uh, provocative uh, remarks against China and Russia, which made it even more difficult for the South Korean government to gain cooperation from the two countries uh, to make any progress on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, recently, the uh, Russian uh, government sent the uh, defense minister uh, to um, North Korea uh, for the uh, July 27th uh, commemoration uh, event, which is uh, very much unusual because Russia is still at war. And uh, it turns out that North Korea uh, itself asked for the defense minister specifically, not deputy minister, uh, to visit uh, North Korea. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, from the Russian perspective, if South Korea decides to support Ukraine at all costs, Russia 
uh, might decide uh, to um, more uh, aggressively support North Korea against the South. I think now we need to take a more pragmatic approach. Uh, we uh, should not rely uh, on this uh, nationalist um, rhetoric. We have to help the North Koreans because we belong to the Korean same nation. That doesn't work. Now, uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un is like the millennials or the uh, Generation Z. We have to come up with a customized approach that can be really effective in changing uh, his uh, thinking. Uh, let me uh, share with you uh, this uh, anecdote uh, that I was told recently. Now, uh, I heard this uh, from a European ambassador. Now, uh, he said he doesn't understand why South Koreans regard themselves of so much like little shrimps uh, that are suffering in between two giant whales. Uh, the ambassador uh, said that uh, Korea, South Korea is actually like a dolphin that can be uh, more confident uh, finding its own path. Recently, I also had a conversation with a Korean ambassador in uh, Mexico, and um, and we talked about the uh, factories uh, established in Mexico that produce uh, products uh, to be uh, sold uh, in the United uh, States. Uh, and uh, my question was why the Mexican government uh, is uh, so um, why the uh, Mexican government uh, is uh, so adamant in not cooperating with the U.S. government in uh, you know, cracking down on the uh, illegal migration. The answer was that because Mexico doesn't have North Korea. We have to uh, uh, remind of ourselves that if we fail to resolve the conflict uh, ourselves, we might end up uh, in a more dire situation. Thank you very much, Mr. Kim. Uh, as I mentioned briefly, uh, there is a resolution submitted uh, in the uh, U.S. Congress um, on the uh, 17th anniversary of the armistice, uh, and there is uh, another one uh, in the uh, Korean uh, National Assembly. I hope that uh, resolution uh, can be adopted, uh, calling for uh, more actions uh, for permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula. Let's move on to the next speaker. The next person that we will be hearing from on the panel, let me introduce him. Whether it's the United States, Japan, Russia, or South Korea, they all say we are under threat. That's why we need to build up more weapons. Uh, that's why we need to spend more on the military. That is their excuse. But it, th those are all empty words of militarism. But there is something that some uh, some an organization that is more than a hundred years old that is very critical of such a stance and such logic, and it's a North it's a Nobel Peace Prize laureate. That is the International Peace Bureau. So we have with us today former executive at director of IPB, Rainer Brown. It's a great pleasure and honor to be today with you and to share thoughts with you. You know, I will not read my speech. You can read it in the book. I will try to give you some impressions after these highly interesting speeches of today and these many thoughts we could listen to. And I will start with a very personal impression. I was born 30 kilometers far away from the border between the two German countries. I know how a border looks like. It was a part of our youth and our life. And this brings the question, how could Germany, in which conditions we could get the unification of Germany? And can other parts of the world maybe learn lessons from it? Not copy it, that's impossible. But maybe learn lessons. And maybe I would like to say four thoughts which are value 
to also for you to have it in mind. First, I think you need a specific historical situation where changes, international changes, are coming up to the agenda. And these changes in the second half of the 80s, they have one name. This is the name of Mikhail Gorbachev. He brought new impressions and new thoughts in international politics and changed minds and hearts. And I'm totally convinced that historical situations like these are coming because it's a time of changing in the international atmosphere. The old times are over. The new times are not really born, but they are in development. And this brings much deeper changes on the agenda than we have in mind. And this includes not only the 55 wars we have in the war, this includes not only the Ukrainian war, I think this includes also the situation in the, in the Pennsylvania, in the Korean Pennsylvania and in other parts of the world. The second, and this is deeply connected to this, is the people's power. The people's power changed at the end of the 90s, the situation in two both, in both German countries. The people in East Germany don't want to live under the same conditions than before. This creates a totally new situation in the society and opened doors for deeper changes till to unification. The third point is that these politics and these developments were prepared. They were not falling from the heaven or coming from God. They were prepared by an international politics which has one name. It's the policy of common security. It's a policy because accept the security interests of the other side like your own security interests, which has on the main background the policy of diplomacy, negotiations, dialogue, common interests, common agreements, steps together for a common future. Avoid any kind of confrontation. Have always in mind the interests of the other side and find common points between the different interests. These policy prepared the changes which were coming up in Germany at the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s. So nothing was falling from the heaven. It was prepared by politicians, and these politicians have name. One of the names is Willy Brandt or Egon Bahr, which prepared the possibility for these huge changes in Europe. And I think from these changes, we can learn now in the international situation, and I think I was not saying anything new for you, which was never so dangerous. And to describe the danger of the situation in one world, word, I'm using the word doomsday clock. I think the doomsday clock by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientist, which says we are 90 seconds before 12. And here are a lot of elder people. I think all of you remember the Cuban crisis, which was mainly the most difficult situation in the Cold War period. At that time, the doomsday clock stand seven minutes to midnight. Now it is 90 seconds. I think this shows the danger we are facing. And it is only, we are only one short step far away from the nuclear disaster. As a short-term killing of the planet and the second huge disaster, the climate change, which is maybe a long-term killing of human beings. So we should have this in mind. When I'm saying this, we have to discuss how we can overcome this. And I think we all agree that the politics we see today, these politics of confrontation about aggression of military budget developments. You know, we are spending two trillion every year for military spending. And one billion people are going with hunger to bed every evening and every night. This is the reality. And when you are facing this reality, we have to look for alternatives. And the alternative for me is, again, common security. Common security means we have to find regional cooperative answers of all crises in the different parts of the world. And we have to find global answers to the existential crisis like climate or uh, biodiversity, hunger, or um, water problems. 
And this brings me to the last point in my speech. This will not happen without us. Without the people's movement, without the movement staying the tradition of Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela and others, we are the people who will change the world. And even when we sometimes go to bed and are deeply frustrated, we have to know that we can change it. And this is our obligation, and this makes me so proud to be with you today and try to do our best for changing the world. Thank you. The annual military budget is 1.5 times more than the total GDP of North Korea. And that calculation was a few years back, so it's probably grown even bigger now. South Korea government, even during the six-party talks and any military talks, they have never talked about uh, disarmament or reducing the military budget. So that's something uh, that Rhino Brown has uh, emphasized. And we are together with uh, such actions and calls. Yes, disarmament. It's not easy to talk about disarmament in Europe right now these days because, and or uh, condemn or oppose militarism. But it is because of that, that we have to speak up all the more. And now let's move our attention, shift our attention to online. We have with us today, not in person, regretfully, but people who have joined us online. So the uh, next speaker uh, is from the uh, uh, World Council of Churches, or the WCC, uh, which uh, has been very uh, active uh, in uh, partnering with the uh, Korea uh, Peace Appeal uh, from the beginning, uh, and uh, has also been deeply involved uh, in uh, our planning of the campaign. Uh, we have Mr. Peter Approve, Director of the Commission, uh, of the Churches on International Affairs. Nice to meet you. It must be very early in the morning, so thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, online. Now let me uh, pass the microphone. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. I have to say that uh, now that I see you all there in this important gathering, I am even sorrier than before not to be present with you in person. But I'm very grateful, at least, to have this opportunity to join you online and to represent the World Council of Churches, its leadership, its 352 member churches in 140 countries, and its total global constituency of something like 580 million people around the world. So following your instructions, Mr. Moderator, I'm going to try and abbreviate uh, the presentation that I'd submitted in writing and skip over some of the history that is, of course, very well known uh, to all of us in this conference. But I'm going to start by referring to the role of John Foster Dulles, who was the US Secretary of State, who at the Geneva Conference of 1954 resisted concrete steps for a peace treaty to replace the armistice agreement, and which set the stage for 70 years of suspended, continued state of war on the Korean Peninsula. Now, the same John Foster Dulles had been a leading figure in the Federal Council of Churches of Christ in the USA, the predecessor of the current National Council of Churches, as well as in the formative discussions prior to the formal establishment of the World Council of Churches itself in 1948. Interestingly, he had been a key proponent of the role of churches in international affairs during the period leading up to and through the Second World War. He'd been strongly opposed to the American atomic attacks on Japan, and in the immediate aftermath of the bombings, drafted a public statement that called for international control of nuclear weapons under United Nations auspices. However, he subsequently became convinced that the threat of nuclear weapons was necessary to confront and roll back communist expansionism. And it was, I believe, in part due to his influence that the World Council of Churches expressed support 
for the UN intervention on the Korean Peninsula in 1950. But subsequently, WCC has consistently rejected the use of force in the region, and for some 40 years has been actively supporting inter-Korean efforts through the National Council of Churches in South Korea and the Korean Christian Federation in the DPRK for the peaceful reunification of the divided Korean people, whose division and suffering has its roots in the geopolitics of the Cold War, in which John Foster Dulles also played a leading role. It's important to recall that though the 1953 Armistice Agreement explicitly prohibited the introduction of new weapons into Korea by either side, the US unilaterally abrogated that prohibition and in January 1958 deployed nuclear armed missiles and atomic cannons to South Korea, shortly followed by nuclear armed cruise missiles with, a, with the range to reach China and the Soviet Union. What followed, of course, was a long and complex history of distrust and confrontation, punctuated by episodes of attempted rapprochement, undermined by bad faith and deceit, it has to be said, on both sides. Following North Korea's first successful nuclear weapon test in October 2006, the persistent demand has been for the complete, irreversible and verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula as a precondition for dialogue, sanctions relief, and in effect, for peace. Though the period 2017 to 2019 offered real prospects of steps towards a sustainable peace in the region, these hopes founded in the gulf between the North Korean expectations of a step-by-step -step process and incremental sanctions relief and the Trump administration's insistence on a once and for all agreement for complete unilateral denuclearization by the North. It was a tragically and unnecessarily missed opportunity for peace in the region. Meanwhile, from 2013 onwards, the WCC had been working with the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN, in a process that sought to create a new treaty for the global prohibition and elimination of nuclear weapons in light of their unconscionable humanitarian impacts. In the subsequent discussions in the UN General Assembly, all nuclear armed or nuclear umbrella states voted against a mandate for negotiating such a treaty, or at best abstain, with one notable exception. On two successive occasions during 2016, one and only one nuclear armed state voted in favor of such a mandate, North Korea. Based upon this mandate, supported by North Korea alone among the nuclear armed or nuclear umbrella states, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons was subsequently drafted, negotiated, adopted, opened for signature and ratification, and entered into force on the 22nd of January 2021. I believe that insufficient attention has been paid to North Korea's role in this context or to the meaning of its votes in support of this initiative. But I believe that those votes convey a message that while resisting pressure to disarm unilaterally, North Korea would be open to engagement in a multilateral process for global denuclearization. Sadly, this thesis has not been tested due to the rejection by the incumbent nuclear powers of any such process that would oblige them to denuclearize too. Both the geopolitical climate and the COVID-19 pandemic have meant that dialogue and encounter have been rendered impossible during the period since the inconclusive DPRK US summit in Hanoi. And now we are once again in a new cycle of escalating confrontation and provocation with all the attendant risks of catastrophic conflict. Such cycles will continue to recur unless new initiatives for peace are pursued with patience and with realism. A formal declaration of the end of the Korean War could be a powerful circuit breaker and catalyst for peace. The WCC's 10th Assembly in 2013 in Busan, South Korea, 
brought the unfulfilled search for peace in the region back into the minds of the worldwide ecumenical movement and onto WCC's agenda with increased strength. But the commitments made in Busan, which provided the foundations for intensified engagement by the WCC for peace on the Korean Peninsula in the intervening years, were renewed, I'm happy to say, at the 11th Assembly in Karlsruhe, Germany, in September 2022. A minute adopted by the Karlsruhe Assembly specifically urged WCC member churches and partners to renew their solidarity and to actively support and accompany the Korean churches in their advocacy for peace, reconciliation, and reunification on the Korean Peninsula. The Assembly highlighted the annual Sunday of Prayer for the Peaceful Reunification on the Korean Peninsula, which we'll observe on the 13th of August this year. The Ecumenical Forum for Peace, Reunification, and Cooperation on the Korean Peninsula, which I have the honor to chair, and the Korea Peace Peel Campaign. And just last month, the WCC Central Committee adopted a statement in which it expressed concern about the accelerating cycle of confrontation and provocation between joint US-Japan-South Korea military exercises and North Korean missile tests, and prayed for peace and dialogue to end this dangerous cycle, and for denuclearization not only of the Korean Peninsula, but of the entire world. The Central Committee observed that 70 years of suspended state of war is illogical and a deeply unconstructive context for engaging with current realities on the Korean Peninsula, and it reiterated calls for steps to be taken to formally acknowledge the end of the Korean War by replacing the temporary armistice agreement with a peace treaty. Earlier this week, WCC issued a call to member churches and ecumenical partners who had supported a joint ecumenical peace message in 2020, marking the 70th anniversary of the start of the Korean War, especially those in countries whose armed forces participated in that conflict, to renew their appeals for a formal end to the war in this 70th anniversary of the ceasefire established by the 1953 Armistice Agreement. So I close with this assurance to our sisters and brothers on the Korean Peninsula and the Northeast Asian region. The WCC will continue to be by your side in the work for peace in the region, amplifying calls for a peace treaty to replace the 70-year-old temporary armistice agreement and seeking the peaceful reunification of the long-divided Korean people. I thank you. Uh, so, on the uh, 17th anniversary of the armistice, uh, there are many events uh, that uh, commemorate uh, the war efforts of the countries who sent troops uh, to the Korean War. Uh, on the other side, uh, now the, the uh, WCC is urging its member churches uh, to uh, demand uh, efforts for peace on the Korean Peninsula in the countries that sent the troops. Uh, this is a very meaningful uh, effort. And as uh, the uh, uh, WCC uh, is working uh, for the peace on the Korean Peninsula. I think Koreans also have responsibility to work on peace on the global level. Let's move on uh, to uh, Japan. Now, the uh, Korean administration is saying the Korea-Japan relations is best uh, in history, but there are people who are neglected in becoming invisible. Now, uh, we have a speaker who is uh, speaking for the people whose existence uh, have been uh, made invisible. We have Mr. Uh, Song Chung. Uh, so, uh, from the uh, uh, Japan Area Committee for Implementation of June 15 yeah. Joint Declaration. Joining us online. Can you hear us? Yeah. Okay. Please introduce us to the activities of the Japanese Committee. Hello, my name is Song Chung-seok. 
And I want to say it's a great honor for me to speak on this meaningful occasion at the International Symposium on behalf of the Secretariat of the Overseas Committee for Implementation of the June 16th Joint Declaration, the Japanese Committee. And I'd like to send uh, greetings of warm solidarity to uh, brothers and sisters from around the world. The new Cold War and the multilateralism are emerging as aspirations uh, for each side, and uh, we, are, we are seeing escalating tensions in this region. We are commemorating the 70th anniversary of the armistice, and we are, don't seem to be any closer to the, uh, peace or the end of the war. On the 24th of June, our Japanese committee had a, a campaign and march uh, that gathered more about 760 uh, peace activist groups. And we had one of the largest scale uh, rallies that we had ever had. And we poured all our efforts into that. And I'd like to give my report on in reflecting on that very uh, progressive and huge scale uh, effort and campaign. Because of the COVID pandemic, we have had not had meetings for a very long time. But on March 15th, we held the seventh chairperson's meeting of the June 15th Overseas Committee via video conference. And we resolved to participate in the Korea Peace Action for the 70th anniversary of the armistice from April 27th to July 27th. In particular, on the 27th of April, we connected online uh, many peace activist groups. And at the 20, uh, uh, peace conference to resolve the crisis of the Korean War and realize peace, 70 years after the armistice, we had uh, Korean groups in the 20 prefectures of Japan, seven organizations, the M American Area Committee and the Area Committees and Organizations of Europe the Pacific, the South Central America, and we all gathered together online and agreed to launch petition drives and other public events as part of the Global Action for Korea Peace in 300 locations, in addition to joining the petition drive for the 1 million signatures. And for example, and then on, on April 29th, the American uh, committee successfully organized the human chain event with aspirations towards autonomous Korean reunification at Grand Central Station. And although the rain forced uh, commit the committee to relocate the event from uh, the plaza to inside the train station, uh, we carried over 40 pickets and 150 unification flags as we marched. And the European Area Committee, for its part, organized an online seminar in celebration of the 23rd anniversary of the June 15th Declaration and released a statement. And the Canadian uh, Committee ran an ad in the Chungang Ilbo uh, Vancouver edition demanding the cessation of ROK U.S. military exercises and sanctions and hostilities against North Korea. And also, uh, the uh, Central South American Area Committee organized a protest in front of the Torre de Angel in Mexico City 
to voice objections to Japan's decision to release contaminated uh, Fukushima power plant water into the Pacific Ocean, and also to condemn the U.S. ROK Japan military alliance. And the Korean Federation for Democracy and Reunification in Japan has been organizing candlelight vigils and marches in partnership with other Japanese organizations at major hubs of activity across Tokyo since April. And the Association for Peaceful Korean Unification II held the Unification Forum in Tokyo on May 13th, celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Inter-Korean Roundtable by declaring our action today for autonomous and peaceful unification. The passion and commitment expressed at that forum uh, continued into the unification lecture series. And the global action for peace, Korea peace in 300 locations brought the Korean diaspora and other peace supporters from around the world together. And uh, the campaign has partnered with labor movement in a peace forum that encompasses all classes and sectors of society. And in Sendai, Yokohama, Nagoya, uh, Osaka, Hiroshima, and uh, many places, uh, we s organized protests and marches opposing the combined military exercises uh, of the United States with Japan and the uh, and Korea. And we condemn the uh, increasing armament and militarization that is stoking the threats of war in this region. And all our struggles and movements have produced and culminated in the collection of photographs on the global action for Korea peace in 300 pl places. So it, we've had this uh, exhibition uh, so that we can take in at one glance uh, the, all the activities of the overseas committees. And the desire and support for peace actions are growing around the world now that the July 27th uh, is upon us. And so the International Symposium from Threat of War to Peace uh, uh, was held in July 14th. And we are joining all of you online in this international symposium today. And we are also uh, pouring all our efforts to condemning uh, Japan's past crimes against the uh, Koreans, the Joseon people who are residing in, in uh, Japan. And in is also in commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the uh, massacre of Koreans in the wake of the Kanto earthquake. Back then, uh, there was a great earthquake that hit the Kanto region, and uh, the Japanese proceeded to kill over 6,000 Koreans that had settled in that region at the time. And throughout the past history, the Japanese government has steadfastly refused to apologize, let alone compensate for the massacre, while devoting all its energy instead to a historical cover-up and revisionism. And the Japanese state continues to discriminate against, oppress, and violate the fundamental rights of people of Korean descent who are the direct offspring of Japanese colonial rule. And we oppose that as well. Now that Japan is on the verge of remilitarizing itself into one of the greatest military powers of the world, it is critical to voice our opposition and condemnation of this as much as possible. So the Japan Area Committee is going to be launching further action uh, to this end. And I hope that you will follow uh, uh, up on the details of that plan as we move forward. And we have invited uh, many eminent uh, people to this peace forum. And we have built solidarity with the uh, uh, people who are in the committee for the commemoration of victims and attribution of responsibility for the Kanto earthquake massacre. And there will be uh, students as well as young people who will be holding their own rallies and meetings and voicing their condemnation of the Japanese government for their wrong actions. Uh, because we are running out of time, could you please uh, abbreviate and uh, wrap up your presentation, please? Because we are running out of time. All right. 
And through the solidarity campaign in celebration of the 78th anniversary of Korea's liberation from Japan, and we will be extending that into the UN General Assembly as well. And we will, we promise that we will be with all of you in all these efforts. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. There are so many activities and campaigns that are going on around the world in the name of uh, trying to realize the goals as stated in the June 15th uh, Joint Declaration. And I'm sure they're all very valuable. Uh, I'm sorry that I was not able to give you enough time to do a full report on all those activities. Uh, you mentioned the diaspora, and these diaspora have the Korean diaspora has been invaluable as an, one of the biggest driving forces for our peace campaign as well. You have. Uh, uh, Mr. Song has introduced uh, some of them in, in Europe and in North America. And now I'd like to move on to uh, the last but not least, uh, one of the last speakers who are joining us online, or maybe not the last one. Well, we have uh, another last Zoom participant. So the uh, next speaker represents a very important partner uh, for the uh, Korean uh, peace movement and the campaigns against war and against nuclear weapons. Representing Forum for Peace, Human Rights and Environment, we have Mr. Sano Michio joining us online. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to the symposium. Today I'm going to talk about what's happening in Japan. Uh, you can uh, go to uh, page 116 in the booklet in Korean uh, and page 120 in English. So uh, this year uh, actually marks the 100th uh, anniversary of the uh, uh, Great Earthquake uh, of Kanto and the Korean Genocide. Uh, so the Japanese government has not apologized uh, for the uh, genocide uh, of the Korean people that occurred during Japan's colonization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, furthermore, it has not conducted a thorough investigation to determine the accurate number of victims, nor has it acknowledged the truth of what occurred. In recent years, there have also been efforts to rewrite history and deny the occurrence of certain events. Tokyo Governor Yuriko Koike exemplified this by refusing to send a message to the uh, memorial service. The 2001 UN Durban Declaration states that colonialism must be condemned in its reference prevented. However, the Japanese government continues to engage in discriminatory practices rooted in colonialism, as demonstrated by their refusal to provide free tuition for Korean high schools. Even when it comes to the Korean forced labor issue or the Japanese comfort women issue, Japan never takes a stance to reflect on its colonization. Looking at the issue of reforming Japan's immigration laws, it is clear that the repatri repatriation of Koreans to Japan after World War II is the underlying cause of the current immigration situation. The failure of post-war Japanese society to reflect on its colonial past is the root cause of repeated human rights violations against foreigners despite its current emphasis on multiculturalism and multi-ethnic coexistence. So please refer to the next paragraph for what the Peace Forum has been doing. 
Let me now move on to part four about the challenges surrounding uh, Korean schools. So this year, 2023, marks the 75th anniversary of the 424 education struggle, which started in response to the 1948 school closure order. This order was the Japanese government's initial attempt to suppress Korean schools established by Koreans in Japan after the liberation in 1945. The Peace Forum collaborated uh, with the urgent action in front of the Ministry of Education of Japan on April 21st to advocate for the protection of the right to ethnic education for children attending Korean schools. Uh, and uh, the Peace Forum also organized the commemorating uh, event uh, on April 24th uh, in front of the graves of uh, Park Chubam and Kim Tae-il, uh, the victims of the 424 uh, e education struggle. In 2013, the Ministry of Education revised the decree to exclude Korean schools from the free high school system policy. Uh, the policy has been implemented in Japan since 2010, but now Korean high schools are no longer eligible to apply in the first place. As of October 1st, 2019, not only Korean kindergartens, but also foreign kindergartens that fall under the category of various schools, such as the Brazilian schools, were no longer eligible for the kindergarten nursery school and daycare center free of charge uh, system. Korean universities were exclu excluded from the Student Support Emergency Grant System, which was implemented as part of the coronavirus countermeasures. In 2023, the Children's Basic Law came into effect. The purpose of the Basic Law is to uh, a quote, achieve a society in which all children and young people can lead a happy life in the future, unquote, as stated in a booklet published by the Child and Family Affairs Agency. All children living in Japan should be treated without discrimination. However, as mentioned above, children attending uh, Joseon schools or Korean schools face discrimination from kindergarten to university. On June 27th, the National Network Supporting Korean Schools uh, and the Contact Group Against the Exclusion of Free uh, Korean Schools organized uh, a rally uh, to engage in a dialogue with the Ministry of Children, Family, and Social Affairs, and the Ministry of Education, and the Cabinet Office, the Ministry of Justice, and the Ministry of Finance regarding the children's basic law. Unjustified discrimination against Korean schools by the Japanese government has resulted in hate speech and hate crimes directed towards these educational institutions. For the sake of peace in Northeast Asia and the establishment of diplomatic relations between Japan and North Korea, it is crucial to eradicate discrimination in Japan. It is necessary to eliminate the sense of discrimination that originated from colonization and persists today. Let me uh, wrap up my talk now. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Michio. Uh, you prepared a long paper, but uh, because of the time constraint, uh, you were only able to talk about uh, a part. So um, you talked about the discrimination against the uh, uh, Chinese, Korean, Japanese. 
as well as the historical issues and uh, the issue of hatred and discrimination common to all countries around the world. And I believe uh, it was also uh, closely uh, related to uh, what the uh, Professor Kim sung kyung described in uh, session one. I think the Korean society is experiencing same problems. So today, um, we are commemorating uh, the uh, signing of the armistice. And as we uh, sit here, the U.S. is just turning to July 27th. Uh, and our partners uh, and uh, colleagues are organizing rallies uh, today uh, in the U.S. So the next speaker uh, uh, will be sharing uh, with us what's happening in the U.S. We have with us Christine Ahn, Echo, and Christine Ahn. Uh, we'll be meeting them Greetings through, to video, all of our through a video. With the Korea Peace Appeal campaign and peace loving people around the world. In 2015, on the 70th anniversary of Korea's division by the United States and the former Soviet Union, Women Cross DMZ, with our partners in both North and South Korea, led a women's peace walk across the DMZ from North to South Korea. We walked with 10,000 Korean women and held women's peace symposia in both Pyongyang and in Seoul. While the 30 women who crossed the DMZ were an international delegation, many from countries that participated in the Korean War, the majority were American women. That's because we felt that it was important for people in the United States to understand the long history of US involvement on the Korean Peninsula. In the United States, the Korean War is called the Forgotten War. In 2019, we launched the Korea Peace Now campaign, and we decided with our core partners that we needed to prioritize investment in the U.S. peace movement. That's when we launched the Korea Peace Now Grassroots Network, which now comprises 13 chapters across the country with hundreds of activists mobilizing together to advance a Korea Peace Agreement. Although the situation on the peninsula is more dangerous than ever, we are heartened to know that our movement is only growing in numbers and collective power. We now have members of Congress, academics, military experts, denuclearization experts, members of separated families, humanitarian aid workers, and multi-generational Korean Americans pushing together to replace the ceasefire with a peace agreement. Our challenge is to strengthen our collaboration as a global movement and make clear that our ability to build just, democratic, democratic, and resilient societies depend on a peaceful and demilitarized future. We're excited that the new documentary film, Crossings, about our movement will air on national public television and provide a much needed narrative shift about the Korean War and Americans' responsibility to help end it. Now, I would like to introduce Hyun Suk Cho to talk about the grassroots power we are building and the historic mobilization we are leading in Washington, D.C. this July. We look forward to staying in touch and ending this war. Hello, my name is Cho Hyun Suk Echo, and I'm an organizer of the Korea Peace Now Grassroots Network in the United States. Uh, this network is a network of peace activists led by Koreans living in the United States and American activists as well. We have around 300 members comprising 10 regional chapters and three caucuses. Uh, the caucuses would be the Christian, Korean-speaking, and younger generation caucuses. We are united in our collective goal to end the longest-running war of the United States and to achieve permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula. The main way we do this is through advocating for legislation in Congress, the Peace on the Korean Peninsula Act, which calls for serious, urgent diplomacy in pursuit of a binding peace agreement to end the Korean War. And this is called H.R. 136, 1369. 
And our network also works to educate the U.S. public about these consequences of the ongoing Korean War by hosting events in our communities, writing op-eds and letters to the editor in local newspapers, and holding rallies and other activities. The Korean War is referred to as the Forgotten War in the United States. As such, reminding and educating Americans about the war that they should we, that we should not be forgetting is the challenge for KPNGN. So it is a challenge, and we find it quite difficult, but we are doing it. And also, as you are well aware, the fact that the Korean issue is never an urgent issue for the United States lawmakers as they are responding to numerous wars and aggressions that the U.S. is involved in around the world is another obstacle for us. However, thanks to our organizing efforts, we held our eighth annual Korea Peace Advocacy Week this year. During this Advocacy Week, held in the first week of June, our constituents requested 140 congressional offices in the House and Senate from 28 states for their support. As a direct result of this work, we were able to gain more supporters in Congress for the H.R. 1369 uh, Act. Because of the pandemic, it was very difficult to organize uh, in-person meetings, but this July 27th, we will bring at least 1,000 people to Washington, D.C. to urge President Biden and Congress to end the Korean War with a peace treaty. We have planned many events, including a press conference with Republican uh, a representative, House of Representatives a member Barbara Lee, uh, and a rally at the White House, and an interfaith vigil, and a conference featuring top military and nuclear experts who will discuss the importance of focusing on human-centered security rather than military-centered arms building to create a happier, more peaceful world together. Next, let's listen to the meaning of the July 27th held uh, event held in the United States through Kathy Che, who is working very hard to prepare Thank for that Thank you, event. Echo. My name is Kathy Choi. I am the Director of Policy and Organizing for Women Cross DMZ and the co-coordinator along with Echo of the Korea Peace Now Grassroots Network. This July, on the 70th anniversary of the armistice, we are bringing together hundreds of individuals from across the United States, hailing from all different backgrounds, calling for Korea Peace. As the United States is the biggest obstacle for peace in Korea, we know that it is our duty to do our part to end the war. Our movement spans generations, regions, heritages, and racial backgrounds. In addition to the hundreds of passionate peacemakers coming from across the country to DC, we have recruited a cohort of 30 brilliant young activists and community leaders, our 30 under 30. In this cohort, we have doctors, lawyers, filmmakers, journalists, artists, teachers. They come from all across the country, many of themselves Kyoko. They all share a deep commitment and fire to fight for peace in Korea and to be themselves bridges connecting the United States to the Korean Peninsula. Yoon Ra is one of these 30 under 30. They are a filmmaker who has recently connected with their Harabaji in Ansan, who himself makes films with other elders about peace in Korea. We continue to bridge generations across oceans and across nations. Today, we are seeing an unprecedented loud cry for peace and calls for ends to America's forever wars across the globe. The younger generation has seen all too closely what the consequences are of US hypermilitarization, a ballooning military budget, contributing to our climate crisis and collapsing domestic social services. We know that our fates are intricately tied to our brothers and sisters across the globe, and it is only by building transnational alliances that we can have a safe, healthy future for all. In D.C., younger and older generations will convene together, share lessons and guidance. In addition to the rally, vigil, and community gatherings mentioned by Christine and Echo, we will be hosting a strategy session and academic conference where we will consider the past decades of this movement and set our course going forward. We will hone our strategies to change the narratives around the Korean War in the United States, as well as strategize our legislative advocacy efforts to push our elected officials. Together, we will bring this movement into its next chapter and ensure that we will see an end to this war in our lifetimes. Thank you so much for your support. Peace in Korea. 예, 감사합니다.
Yes, thank you very much. Uh, with this video message, uh, we have come to the end of the panel discussions. Ten people, uh, ten presentations by 12 people. Why did we have to listen to so many presentations? Today, on the 70th anniversary of the armistice, we wanted to reaffirm that so many people from all around the world, from all walks of life, are adding their power and their dedication to this effort, to this campaign. Uh, we thought that we needed to see this for ourselves, that our campaign is really moving forward with so many people participating. We wanted to check that again. So that's why maybe we don't have so, that, that many questions. But let's look at one question. The question goes to Mary. So in the uh, Ulaanbaatar process uh, of JPEG, uh, the North Korean side is taking part. Uh, so that's why the process is so meaningful. However, the, uh, since the pandemic, North Korea seems to be very passive uh, towards dialogue with anyone uh, in the uh, international society. Uh, what does uh, JPEG have as, uh, in plan to uh, uh, resume the dialogue with the North Korean side? I'll use the microphone, sorry. Um, and I'll be very quick, I think, given the time. Um, as you say, of course, it is very challenging at the moment with the current situation, but we, as other people, other organizations in the same position are doing what we can to sustain the conversation, sustain the engagement and cooperation in the ways that we have possible at the moment. Uh, we are still in regular contact via telephone, via email, and so on as we can. Um, for example, when we have had our Ulaanbaatar process meetings, the first one in person we restarted again in September last year, and then once again this year, ensuring that we do have input via writing in advance, via statements that we can share on behalf of partners from the DP and so on, so that they are a part of the conversation, even if they're not physically able to be in the room with us yet. And uh, the question mentioned that they're a little bit passive, but I would say um, at least our impression is probably our partners in the DPRK are perhaps even more frustrated at the current situation that it's not possible for, for having this direct in-person exchange uh, than anyone really. Um, this uh, wanting to have this information, this exchange, this um, you know regular uh, go back to, to these possibilities again. Uh, so we do have an agreement with uh, them that as soon as it is possible for either us to travel there or them to travel somewhere else, we will be convening in person um, as soon as that is possible. And so just making sure that we can sustain the communication, sustain, show that there is this will to continue the cooperation, um, which we very much do feel from their side as well. Of course, the fact that it's continued for so long, more than three years now, is, is much longer than any of us had hoped, but doing what we can to sustain and make sure that that partnership is continuing in the meantime so that we can then, um, as soon as it is physically, uh, logistically possible to restart in person once again. Thank you for the answer. It seems there is no other question. Uh, it seems to me that uh, Mr. Lee Ju Song uh, uh, had too little time, so you can talk a little more. Well, as a humanitarian myself, I wanted to give uh, uh, some of my time to other speakers. Uh, you know, uh, there are many challenges, uh, but we are not lonely uh, because of one another here. I believe that all the organizers of today's symposium uh, can smile together tomorrow uh, and uh, shake hands with our partners in North Korea. I love you everyone here. Thank you.
So uh, that was a very graceful uh, closing comment, I think, uh, which makes it unnecessary for me to make any further comment before closing. Uh, just one more thing. Now, this uh, Korea uh, Peace Appeal campaign uh, uh, in the uh, related activities will continue. That we'll uh, keep collecting the uh, uh, signatures uh, for the petition. And uh, on the 20th, 22nd of August, we have a uh, large rally. And in the uh, UN General Assembly uh, held in September, we're going to also organize rallies uh, in um, other events for peace uh, in New York. In We'll also have some time to look back, uh, take a look back, uh, to think about what we have done uh, for the last few years and, uh, uh, and uh, start anew. Uh, so I uh, personally, I believe uh, we have successfully gathered the energy uh, for a peace and we will be able to make further steps. Thank you very much. We'll take, have a photo op session. Will all the participants please come forward? Let's have a picture taken together. Don't go. Uh, please come forward for the picture before you go. Your audience on YouTube and Zoom, thank you. And I'm sorry for not being able to uh, say uh, official uh, farewell to all of you as well. Now, with that, uh, we wrap up today's symposium and uh, take a photo together. <laughs>